Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The stage is set for the European Central Bank to raise interest rates this month for the first time in more than a decade. Inflation in the Eurozone rose higher than expected to a record last month. Consumer prices jumped 8.4% from a year ago. Once again, they were driven by soaring costs for both food and energy. China's President Xi Jinping defended his crackdown on Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement in a landmark speech marking the 25th anniversary of Chinese rule. Xi said the former British colony should focus on its economic development. He said Hong Kong has entered a new stage of moving from chaos to governance. A labor contract for 22,000 U.S. West Coast dock workers is on the verge of expiring, but both sides appear willing to avoid strikes, lockouts, or work stoppages during the busiest season of the year for shipping. The current agreement between the dock workers' union and more than 70 employers ends today. A deal before the deadline is unlikely. And the college sports world has been rocked, and it may be only the start. UCLA and Southern California have agreed to leave the Pac-12 conference and join the Big Ten, a predominantly Midwestern league. The move comes as the Big Ten is about to sign a giant TV contract. The shakeup could lead to more movement of schools in the so-called Power Five conferences. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. about what they call black soot caused by the manufacturing and consumption of these fuel products in the illegal refineries. Oil theft, known as bunkering, and the refining of its spoils is worsening the damage from decades of fossil fuel exploitation, creating one of the world's most severe ecological disasters. Our sacred forests, our homes, have to give way to oil wells. And no one gets much benefit. Imagine a resident of Potakot who inhales this suit every second in 24 hours, seven days a week, 30 days in the month, and for years now, we are dying slowly but surely, and our lifespan is reducing every day. What's happening on Wall Street? It's the basic law of economics. It validated what the market was already pricing. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. David, you just hit the nail right on the head. From business's most influential and instrumental. And that's the way you run good risk management. It's a challenging dynamic. We could continue to see that kind of strength. Bloomberg Wall Street Week premieres Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
I think that it's hard to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. Crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. down gas, oil and gasoline prices, we might actually be able to avert uh, some of the worst parts of the recession because uh, people would be would be extremely relieved if prices, say, went down, say, oil went down to $80 a barrel would be a huge uh, relief for, for many. That was Ellen Wald, the senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. 80 feels like a long way away at this point, but we're getting closer. 108 on WTI at the moment. Crude shaping up as follows. Crude positive 2.6%, backing away from the highs of close to 120, 130, 140 earlier on in the spring. Futures are negative a half of 1% on the S&P. Euro dollar is negative four tenths of 1%. Upside surprise on CPI from the Eurozone today, 8.6%. Core just a bit softer. The ECB meeting July 21st. More data stateside later, the ISM manufacturing, Tom, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah, those are big numbers, John. I don't think we've said enough about inflation hasn't come down. That's what the data says. That's what the data says, but yeah. the market, implied rates of inflation in the market, so-called break-evens, Tom, we are starting to see them roll over. We're starting to see them roll over. For those that survived 4 p.m. yesterday in New York, all you need to know, yeah, futures down, big deal. VIX has done next to nothing, 28 level. And John's been talking up yields here, nine basis points in the two-year yield, John, 2.85%. Gets your attention, doesn't it, Tom? Yeah. It's four days of it now. <clears throat> four days of it. Treasuries up, yields lower. The data, not terrific. Bramo, Bramo would say it's a toxic brew of recession worry. Will Kennedy joins now. Running all of our for executive <laughs> editor for energy and commodities. Well, I want to not do oil. I want to do well, copper uh, here as well. Copper is malleable, and there's a thing called copper ore that China brings in by droves. If LME copper goes under 8,000, if copper rolls over, how does that relate to a China rolling over? I think LME copper is still very priced, very linked to the Chinese economy. China consumes half the world's copper. Um, and it really tells you something about the outlook, perhaps, for the Chinese economy, for the Chinese construction sector in particular, one of the single biggest uh, drivers of copper demand. It's fascinating what's happened to the copper market. We're down right now 18% uh, this year. Um, copper is pricing here in a recession. I think it's, it's really come off. And one thing I would draw is the contrast between copper, which is pricing in a downturn and oversupply, and energy, even though we've come off the highs, remains incredibly strong. Yeah. Copper down this year, oil still up 44%. Explain copper's ubiquity versus nickel. I mean, we all got upset about nickel uh, six months ago, whatever, with the busted trade on the LME and that. Copper's completely different than the treatment of nickel, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, copper's ubiquity is copper equals electricity. And as we enter a more electrified world, as we drive more electric vehicles, as we use more electricity, that means millions of tons of copper into power grids, into electric cars, into all sorts of appliances. Um, and people are very bullish about the long-term outlook for copper. They see more demand than supply and, and gently rising prices. So that makes it all the more striking that we've seen this recent sell-off. All said... Just under eight thousand dollars is a pretty good price historically. Yeah, it's the it's the lowest going back to February twenty twenty one, but still higher <laughs> than it has been over recent years before that. How much will do you take a look at the gap that you've been talking about between metals, which just saw their worst quarter going back to two thousand and eight, and oil now coming down a little bit from some of the highs, but not cooling as much nearly as we're seeing in the metal space. What's the correlation here, and what's the message? I think the message here is that energy, oil, and gas, and coal remains extremely supply constrained. Um, there may be less elasticity in energy because everyone tends to keep driving even if they uh, don't buy a new electric car, and that's probably the difference between oil demand and copper demand. But I think what it's really saying is there's a lot of concern about supply. We've got very tight spreads at the front of the oil curve. If you look at the headlines today, we've got Libya oil production uh, down severely. We've got a lot of talk about just how much extra oil Saudi Arabia 
and the UAE can produce. And then we've got a lot of concern about energy demand going into the winter. Will Europe have enough gas? How much uh, switching into oil will be? How much uh, coal is there? And that all means you've got a lot of concern about demand and a real worry about the world's ability to make it. And a recession will help, but it won't have the dramatic effect that you'll see in metals markets. And I think that's what this spread between oil and copper is telling us. That's a really important point. I want to sit on that for a minute, that basically when we start to see the price of oil go down in the face of recession fears, perhaps that's premature based on the physical market sending a very different message. Is that correct, Will? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think recession fears, frankly, are keeping us from being at 130, 140. The headline price in oil has been pretty range bound in, um, it's bobbed around a bit, but it's sort of been in that 110 to 120, 25 range for some time. Um, but when we dig under the hood of the oil market, when you look at physical prices, when you look at just how hard refineries are working in the US, you know, this week they're going at 95%. They're running as hard as they can. You're seeing the underlying demand for oil, for the time being at least, still remains very strong at a time when both the ability of the crude industry to pump that oil and the refining industry to refine it remains extremely tight. Um, well, yeah. I thought you were done. We've got to go. Oh, well, Kennedy, no, thank I'm you. Of Bloomberg. <laughs> You're awesome anyway. I, I love you, buddy. It's been too long. Thank you. I missed my moment there, didn't I, Lisa? <laughs> Give me a break. I get things Go wrong ahead. sometimes. It's There's okay. one. We're all, all right. We're all I'm to bring you this. I was keen to bring you this, okay? Forgive me. Neil Dutter of an ASOS Macro put this out on Twitter moments ago. It's about flights. He said the following. All the news about flight cancellations ahead of the July 4th holiday has not kept folks from searching for flights. Yep. Goes on to say, search interest is about flat relative to the same day three years ago. And the international search story has been particularly strong of late. The international search story, Thomas, you know, has really taken off over the last few months. I, I'm going to go to Hatzius, even with the Goldman Sachs markdown, saying, look, it's a fully employed America. Chairman Powell said it's a strong economy in front of the Senate. And, and John, the heart of the matter to me is Claudia Sam in her labor analysis saying, how do you have the gloom in a fully employed America? We have to wait to see labor crack. It hasn't. The problem with that, though, Tom, and Lisa, weigh in, because I know you've got thoughts on this. If you wait for labor to crack, in the market at least, it's too late. Let's put this into context with Neil Tutta, who has traditionally been very much a bull on the economic outlook and, frankly, on markets. He actually came out a couple days ago and he said, I've turned cautious on the economic outlook, a place I don't normally find myself. He said, this is and on Twitter, this is a tough one professionally, but if there is a time to hit the alarm bell on the economy, I think this is the time. So, yes, perhaps not as gloomy as some might go, but still a notable shift for yet another bull. Oh, notable to see Dutta and Bramo on the same page about something. That's, that's for sure. True. I mean, I that's something, isn't clear. it? And sure. I'm actually on the same page with Tom that longer term, sure, there will be a pivot point back to some sort of normalcy. I'm just talking yeah, about I... what we're seeing in terms of clouds and et cetera. It, it, where, where's Damien? Like, work from home, work from beach. What, what's Sassar doing? What's Sassar doing? I like, ask him. I've got no idea. From Turks and Caicos? I, I haven't I don't spoken know. to him. Is you know what, segment? EM's, John, sure there is. we're not doing this today. <laughs> I get that. It's a U.S. morning time show. Yeah. EM is unraveling. That's what we're going to talk about in July. Well, we can catch up with Jordan Rocher so about the FX side of that over at Nomura. Just put out a note, Tom. Put out that note moments ago. Short sterling towards 118. Wow. Wow. So he's looking Big for parity number. on euro dollar. And he's wow. looking for 118 he on never sterling. Sends me emails. Cable 120. I think you've got to sign up for his research, Tom. Oh, I do. Futures down six tenths on the S&P. Copper is not Nickelback. <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg.
nuestro estudio, en nuestro experimento, no hemos pintado todos los edificios de blanco, sino estos más asequibles de pintar. Y ya hemos detectado reducciones medias en el área metropolitana de 0,8 grados aproximadamente en un periodo de ola de calor y con picos máximos de 4 grados de disminución en un momento puntual del día, en una zona puntual del día. Y como dices, eh, en una ciudad como Barcelona funciona incluso mejor que las zonas verdes, según, según eh, las modificaciones, nos detectan incrementos, mm, o sea, disminuciones de temperaturas mayores con tejados blancos que con incrementos de, de zonas verdes como tienen planteados el plan de urbanístico. Exclusive interviews with the most influential figures in finance. Lloyd Blankfein. Deflation is a terrible thing. Inflation you could tolerate. Kathy Wood. Tesla will be in the pole position to dominate. Jeremy Grantham. We've had a very, very abnormal honeymoon Goldilocks period. First available on the Bloomberg Terminal, then on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg.com. Front row, the best seats in the house for business's greatest minds. sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan, we did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. just talking about supply chains and higher inflation impacts on margins, but they're talking about demand destruction now. In this environment, inflation will erode purchasing power to a degree. The level of demand destruction that's actually coming through is accelerating. Energy and food inflation are going to be the wild card. That view that we could see recession over the winter months has become a little bit more commonplace in the market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom King, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television. It's real simple. The first day of the third quarter, and the world, John, is catching down to the World Trade Organization with 2.8% global GDP. Maybe that's too optimistic. Here come the downgrades, Tom. We talked about it all through the week, haven't we? We've seen it from Goldman. We saw it from Morgan Stanley overnight. And here comes the move lower in Treasury yields, Tom. A fourth straight day of it. Ten-year right now, 293. Well, 293 on the yields. The yields are moving in nicely. We'll do the data check on that in a moment. But where I see it, John, is the litmus paper, a stronger, resilient dollar. And this morning, the theme is a giveaway in emerging markets. And some of that is the commodities rollover. The dollar story has been more than strong. It's just absolutely <clears throat> ripped-roared through the first half of this year. We've had the biggest quarterly decline on euro dollar going back to late 2016. If the first half was about the Fed, we're about to see something from this ECB we haven't seen since 2011, a rate hike. And we're going to see that time later this month, I believe July 21st. From there, how far can they push this? Because the downdraft we're seeing in economic growth, the expectations around that story in Europe, just soft, right. soft, soft. John, you and me alone next week and what we're going to have. I'm sorry, every single Wall Street firm is working over the weekend to readjust and recalibrate on their forecast. Every You're expecting one. downgrades on the economy side or the equity side? Both. 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 I, I think, okay. as I said earlier, I'm more interested in the strategists, frankly. I'm looking ahead to the earnings too, Tom. Earnings season that, kicking off July equity. 14th. Yeah, yeah, JP Morgan yeah. coming up a few weeks away. What happened this week? What you need to know, folks, as you pile into the weekend and the four-day work week next week is Lisa Bramwitz's world changed. Lisa, credit changed this week. Well, we saw real spread widening. We saw a real fear of recession getting borne out a little bit more in credit, in corporate debt. 
I want to talk, though, about this tension that's really taking hold, and John touched on it just then, talking about the front end, the bid into bonds that we're seeing in light of recession considerations. How much can that be consistent? We're seeing both bonds getting bid even as stocks sell off. This is a traditional relationship, but at what point does this basically say to the <coughs> Fed, we don't believe you? We think you're not going to be able to raise rates as much as you're telling us that you will, as much as many Fed members say that you will, because you won't be able to. Is that right? If it's right. wrong, then what is the potential downside risk to all sorts of risk markets? We give you the news as it comes out. Lindner, the German finance minister, says no more leeway for relief for consumers in 2022 budget. I guess that's the gloom headline of the day. John, let's do the gloom data check. I'll take it easy here. Futures in negative 19, the VIX onch 28.74. Negative on the S&P, Tom, by a half of 1%. We're seeing a story in the NASDAQ, negative 7 tenths of 1%, ugly first half. In the second half, we kick things off with a little bit more of the same. The change, though, yield to lower. Yield. Yield to lower, Tom, by seven basis points. The 293.90, this is a fourth <clears throat> straight day of it. And it's, it's not spread dynamics, John. 8.37 on the 210 vanilla spread. It's really just a compression of the curve, isn't it? And it's not just the U.S. I believe it's in the U.K. as well this morning, Tom. You was just sort of tracking lower, down 11 basis points yeah. on the front end on the gilt curve, Tom. We start strong this hour. Daniel Morris joins us, chief market strategist, BNP Paribas. Daniel, BNP Paribas has been out front, out front for 20 years on gauging slowdowns in the global economy. How do you gauge over the weekend to a new view into the third quarter? Well, we're not coming up with a new view. We've been looking for uh, not necessarily a technical recession, but a significant enough slowdown. Uh, into next year that it's essentially going to feel like one. So we do see with what you have already priced in from the Fed, which honestly, and contradicting a bit some of the comments I just heard, we think may not be enough. So if anything, the Fed hikes yet more than what you already have priced in the market, uh, that that's going to do the job. And the job has to be to slow down growth enough to get inflation down. And we know what that implies. So Dan, that implies tighter financial conditions. They've got a whole lot tighter year today. Walk me through where in this market you think we've got more work to do. Well, you know, the real issue that all the central banks are facing is that on one hand, a lot of their problems, if you will, would go away uh, in terms of inflation if the situation in Ukraine uh, improved significantly and you had commodity prices fall if China were able to get the population vaccinated and could open up and then the supply chain bottlenecks would dissipate. And then you'd see, I think, a really swift fall not only in realized inflation, but then in inflation expectations. And that would do a good chunk of the Fed's job for it. But given that it's unlikely we're going to get such a benign scenario in the near term, they really do need to perhaps ratchet further down on demand to compensate for what they're not getting uh, on some of these temporary factors. This all calls into question, Dan, the 60-40 portfolio after it just suffered its worst start to a year ever, considering that basically it means that we're not seeing enough that's been baked into the bond market and that stocks still face losses. I mean, how much more are we going to see a reversion back to the 60-40 pain that we saw in the first half? Well, I think it really is the timing that's going to be the key thing. I mean, you know, what's always challenging are the transitions from one worldview, from one paradigm to the other. We're going now. Uh, it's, you know, initially, don't forget, the beginning of the year was all about the recovery from the pandemic and reopening. Then we had to factor in the war. Uh, and then you know, I think a lot of people now have sometime next year a recession. But from here to there is where it, clearly it's tricky. Uh, at this point, we are concerned about at least a further prolongation of what you highlighted with yields potentially going up and then uh, a hit to equities. But at some point, we do think you're going to see a more traditional reaction in the market with a rally in Treasury yields, but and then uh, at least relatively better performance for defensive sectors within equities. When does market functioning become a problem, Dan? And we've already seen the lack of liquidity in certain basic instruments, even plain vanilla, vanilla treasuries. We're talking about liquidity getting pulled out of the system, but the balance sheet for the Federal Reserve has just started shrinking this past week, going down by $20.8 million, so not, or $20.8 billion, I should say. So still not a dramatic amount based on how much they're holding. So at what point do you start to see real dysfunction? I don't know if I'd use the dysfunction word currently, but let's say just challenging. And already for, you know, certainly for our credit portfolio managers, uh, it's already difficult. So on one hand, uh, with these sell-offs, I mean, it has at times been quite indiscriminate. Inevitably, 
uh, you get yields rising for companies where we don't think that increase is warranted and you, and you see opportunity, but can you necessarily find the bonds that you want? So uh, things are functioning, but certainly challenging for you know our portfolio managers to navigate the rough waters that we have. Ultimately, Dan, we're all asking different versions of the same question. What forces this Fed to change its mind? <clears throat> what is it? If it's not inflation coming down, do you have to see enough stress elsewhere? And how much stress would you need to see? What does it look like? Can you put a number on it? You know, I, in terms of the, the typical or traditional assumption of some sort of, of central bank foot that that, that to put uh, that another X percent decline in equities is going to get them to stop. I mean, that's not completely irrational insofar as, of course, that tightens financial conditions already, and so to some degree does the Fed's job for it. But given where we are with inflation, given that these temporary factors are going to be there for a while. Uh, and then we have the more structural ones that, you know, to look see, to to be persistent. Uh, it's really going to make it much more difficult for them this time to do that when in the past, when inflation was low, that was the reaction that we got. It's the biggest difficulty we've all got in this market. Dan Morris there of BNP Paribas Asset Management out of London this morning. Dan, thank you. Lisa, that's the difficulty we've all got. We've all got that. This is not 2018. It's not 2015, 16. We don't have that low inflation story that gives this Fed the room, the capacity, the space to say, OK, we won't tighten as much as you thought we would. It's a different story now. To me, the biggest pivot point of the week, and this was a huge one, was hearing that this research out of the Federal Reserve and something that all of the uh, central bankers were really enumerating was the risk of getting inflation out of hand, of longer term expectations becoming unmoored, was greater, and the potential pain was greater than the potential pain of overshooting and raising rates too far. And that highlights where their concern is. It is in that longer term. So it doesn't seem like they will pull back if inflation continues to accelerate. It makes you wonder what the bond market's picking up on on the <clears> front end, doesn't it? We're yes. down 11 basis points on a two-year term, 284. I, I'm going to call it Friday liquidity, maybe. I mean, I'm looking for an excuse, and I can't find it. John, I want to go back to what I said at the top on the World Trade Organization. And you, as you correctly state, World Bank coming in gloomy is, well, I can't say enough, John, how WTO in April looking sub 3% global GDP, that was a stunning announcement then. They absolutely nailed it. And you wonder in July if institutions are going to catch up with the World Trade Organization. And that, Tom, is what many people would define as a global recession. Oh, 3%. Yeah, it's been yeah. the cardinal rule for years. And that's with the 6 or 5% China. And I'm, you know, granted, there's a huge COVID asterisk there. But I, I, I mean, this true, it's a cliche. It is uncharted well, territory. Well, understanding the China piece of it, Tom, I think is so difficult. <clears throat> what does the back half look yeah. like with China? No one knows. Got any idea? Nope. So we nope. have no idea what the back half looks like for the world's second largest economy. Isn't that a big issue? Yeah, I think it's a modest issue. Look at copper again. And copper, folks, you know, for radio, I'm taking my hand and making the St. Louis arch here. I mean, it's, it's over. It's beautiful, Tom. It works. To pre pre thank you. Pre-pandemic. Uh, so somebody emailed on radio and said my, my bow tie was festive. It's festive. On radio. Someone else told me it was St. Patrick's Day at KFC. <clears throat> Somebody else uh, Something also like that. emailed in and said, oh, they did, did they? Uh, <laughs> they emailed in and said, thank God you haven't sung for an hour and a half. Do you want to sing now? No, no, I can't. You can take us out. We've got 30 <laughs> seconds. No, I'm, oh, I'm come not. on, just a little bit more, Tom. July 4th weekend. Uh, you know, Celebrate. I, 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 I you know, my original banner of the morning, I'm sorry. It's gloomy, folks, but it's not 1970. It's not 1974, 1987. Those were real drawdowns. It's not the 1930s. That makes us feel so much better. I'm not Tom. singing Cole Porter. <laughs> it's not 1788. Come on. <laughs> you were standing seven basis points. Your 10 year, 290. Let's call it 294. Your equity market down four tenths and 1% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Inflation in the Eurozone rose higher than expected to a record last month. Consumer prices jumped 8.4% from a year ago. Once again, they were driven by soaring costs for both food and energy. The ECB is expected to raise interest rates this month for the first time in more than a decade. And global food inflation looks set to slow down. Key farm commodities such as wheat, corn and cooking oils are extending their slump to the lowest levels in months. The latest catalyst is a report from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It raised its estimate for the area planted to corn in the world's biggest producer this year. 
In Russia, a trial began today for U.S. basketball star Brittany Griner, who was jailed more than four months ago on cannabis possession charges. The two-time Olympic gold medalist was traveling to play for a Russian team. She could face up to 10 years in prison. The Biden administration calls her wrongfully detained. And shares of coals are falling. The department store chain has concluded a strategic review and decided that it's not prudent to pursue an eight, a potential $8 billion sale to vitamin shop owner franchise group. Coles also revised its sales outlook downwards. And a significant step for Amazon as it pushes deeper into sports. The tech giant has secured the rights to broadcast Europe's top football tournament in the UK for the first time. Amazon will exclusively offer top UEFA Champions League matches on Tuesday nights for three years starting 2024 to 2025 season. BT Sports will retain the majority of coverage. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Companies now, they're getting hundreds, maybe even thousands of applications. So software has come in to automate the process. You want to write your resume for robots, not for humans. The only job your resume has is to be comprehensible to the software that is reading it, because that software or robot is going to decide whether or not a human ever gets their eyes on it. These things are programmed by a certain segment of the population that might not be totally inclusive or not be fully aware. Concerns about how this technology could exacerbate discrimination. For the FTC, I think foremost, the FTC needs to be making sure that we're fully understanding this technology. We don't trust companies to self-regulate when it comes to pollution. We don't trust them to self-regulate when it comes to workplace comp. Why on earth would we trust them to self-regulate AI? the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility. So we have flicked the switch there and really uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. 
And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular is back in Boston, and Bloomberg will make sure you don't miss a second of the fireworks, music, and special appearances by superstar Shaka Khan, Grammy and Tony winner Heather Headley, and the voice winner Javier Colon, plus Middlesex fifes and drums and the Tanglewood Festival Chorus. It all starts July 4th at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Inflation's a bigger risk because it's here. It's real. And if inflation doesn't come under control quickly, it does enormous long-term damage. Is there a risk that we have a recession? Yes, I think uh, clearly there's a significant risk that within the next 12 months we'll have a recession. I think there's a mindset at the Fed that sees inflation as a psychological problem rather than a monetary problem. Senator Pat Toomey there of Pennsylvania on Bloomberg in the last 24 hours from New York City this morning. Good morning. Futures negative on the S&P down four tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq 100 down a half of one percent. Speaking to those concerns about a slowdown in growth, maybe even a recession, yields down another eight basis points. This is one to watch. 293.17 on tens, and we're seeing this rally, Tom, right the way through the curve. Two's out to thirties. Pearls are going to tell us there's an oddity to it, John, but I, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at level here, and again, I want to emphasize this is. Truly a compression. This is not yield dynamics, you know, fancy hands moving around. This is a recession uh, outlook and a, and a fact that a lot of people are going to have to adjust the first week of July. It's interesting to me, Tom, though, you're seeing <clears throat> it more pronounced in the front end. You're mm -hmm. seeing a 12 basis point move on twos lower to 283. If we're going to have this whole conversation about the Fed going too far and right. growth getting hammered, it's interesting to me that it's the two year that's so <clears throat> well bid this morning. Housekeeping, John, Miss Bolt, best-dressed woman in Bloomberg, coming in from watching TV in Paris, of all places. Sure. Great bow tie. Greetings from Paris. There we go. I actually Ms. got Bolt. some nice feedback about, about your outfit as well, Tom. You know, you, you were mentioning Colonel Sanders. Well, I meant, I meant, you know, KFC on St. Patrick's Day, where it's like the tan suit with a bit of green. Yeah, you did that know. Not, well, did that, did that didn't resonate? It's a day to watch us on radio. That's what it is. What, today? <clears throat> yeah. Someone's calling it a summer Friday look. It is. It's a summer a throwback Friday summer Friday trading floor yeah, story you know, is what they would like. President is, is Obama. This, is this what it was like on the trading floor years ago? It was. It, very much yeah. so. It was like, it, what's really sad here, John, seriously, bond market closes, John, at 2? I get an early close. I, I didn't know two, that, Tom. Two, uh, Lisa, help me here. 2 o'clock today? I honestly, you know, I'm not. Ramos long gone. Be on a plane. By that two o'clock. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's completely unfair. All the fancy people in beige suits get to leave early, and the staff has to stay till two or four o'clock. I hate it. I think it's just bad labor. The fancy uh, people policy. wear beige suits, just to clear this up. <clears throat> they do. Terry they Ains do. wears okay. a beige suit. He joins us now, founder of Pangea uh, Policy. Terry, I want to talk about something that's not in the zeitgeist, but I think it's really important going to November 8th of this year. Everybody's talking about rhinos, Republicans in name only. I want you to frame the dino Democrats in name only. Is the president of the United States a dino? <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> good morning. You'd think so by, by his past track record, but uh, I, I think what he's busily trying to do is tack to the left and understand where uh, the, where the majority of his party is and, uh, and seek to represent that. Uh, you know, not for him, the old Gilbert and Sullivan uh, line well, that uh, he led his regiment from behind. But, uh, you know, uh, clearly, I mean, I wasn't surprised by this because you could see where the elector, where the Democratic Party was going uh, even before 2020. Uh, but he has sought to uh, to essentially uh, do everything he can to try to keep his party together. But by and large, uh, go to where the energy and the money is in the party. Where the money is. is. Oh, stop it, Terry. It's where the money is. Help me here after Roe v. Wade and the uproar of June, where suburban and particularly suburban women are as they parse out rhinos, dinos, and the far right and the far left. I think it's much more of an anti-incumbent election, and I think it's much more of an economy election. Uh, the You know, the, the stat coming from Washington that I, I think is not... Uh, much followed on Wall Street, but it's followed greatly here, 
is real per capita disposable income, which has declined 20% since March of 2021. Uh, you know, that's, that's yet another bad sign for Democrats. Uh, I think what you have here is you're going to have a majority Republican uh, Congress in 2023. I set the odds today of that at 60%, largely because the Senate uh, is, uh, the outcomes are much less known. But you're still not going to have any sort of a one-party uh, monolithic majority uh, that you know, clears the decks and sets a definite direction, no matter what it is. Uh, compromise and... Uh, and kind of working together in the center is still going to be uh, where the action is. Think about the gun debate as a, and, and gun law as a recent example of this. Terry, what does it say about this Congress, given the bifurcated nature, given the contention that we see only heating up over social issues and also uh, some of the castigations around inflation, that Congress might not get done this bipartisan agreement on how to boost chip production domestically? I'm sorry to say that, uh, you know, it, generationally, uh, the Congress has become much more performative than legislative. And uh, what, it, it, what it says to me and has said for a long time is that uh, something that is viewed and talked about as an existential threat, China, uh, you know, you can see in the behavior of members in both parties uh, that they must not consider it to be quite the existential threat because a year plus after this legislation was introduced, they still don't have it done. Now, I think there's a high likelihood that the legislation gets done. Today, I'd put that at 80%, uh, but it doesn't say anything good about uh, American foreign policy uh, or resolve uh, to confront China economically that it's taken more than a year to get to the point where we're not quite done yet. <clears throat> Tricky stuff, Terry. Big challenge. Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. And big moves in this bond market. Can we pick up on that? Yeah. Very briefly breaking 280 on a two-year, down 15 wow. basis points on a 10-year, down wow. 10 basis points, call it 11, to 291. These are big moves. That rate cut story was kind of a peripheral story maybe a number of weeks ago. It's getting brought in. We're bringing that rate cut story in at the same time the Fed is considering hiking 75 basis points at the next meeting, Tom. These are some big moves developing in this bond well, market, the, some the, big calls coming through. Yeah, this goes to that strange economic magnitude as well. John, this is a sideshow. IMF just announcing with Ghana, clearly a frontier African economy, uh, that they're going to do a negotiation as Ghana collapses. And I'm looking at the, I hope it's, I'm pronouncing it correctly, John, the SETI, C-E-D-I, the Ghana SETI, USD, GHS is the Bloomberg signal. And I mean, it unravels, John. And again, I go to where, as you try to look forward as hard as we do, you're overcome by events you just don't see coming. I'm watching EMFX right now. It's the S word, stress, and least we've talked about that, that a few times through this morning, particularly in credit over the last week or so. And we're not back to the same kinds of levels of stress by another borough of gauges as we have been in previous downturns or previous times where the Fed has stepped in. But I offer you this tension. Do you think that stocks are offering the same message right now that bonds are with the bid in and this belief the Fed will eventually hit pause? Jordan Rochester is going to join this program in a moment over at Nomura. He's got some big calls. Euro dollar down to parity. Cable sterling against the US dollar. He's looking for 118. He joins us next from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
that it's highly transmissible. We know that two doses of vaccines, Pfizer vaccine specifically, neutralize the virus, but not as efficiently because various studies showing that reduction up to 44, meaning that a third dose is a must for it to successfully neutralize the variant. What we don't know is still that, um, what are the effects of mix and matching between vaccines and what are the uh, capabilities of antibodies produced from this mix and matching? in uh, neutralizing Omicron. Because as we know, uh, many parts of the world uh, use different types of vaccines. And that would be a great data to look at. It will be also great to look at, because majority of the studies done um, you know, uses a small sample number. And most of the time, uh, when you translate it to real world, uh, the data changes. So it will be really good to look at large scale data of the ability of antibodies from vaccines to neutralize this uh, variant. Grateful here today that the virus, Omicron variant, still uses ACE2 receptor as its main entry. It means that all of the vaccines which are designed with spike in mind still works. If imagine if it uses a different receptor other than ACE2, none of the vaccines would work today. So I think that is the best news that we, you know, we got from all these studies which came recently, the past couple of days. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. I wouldn't call this a boring start to Q3 in the second half, that's for sure. Futures down four tenths of one percent on the S and P, but these moves in the bond market get our attention. We're down nine pen basis points on a ten-year to two ninety-two. On a two-year, we're down thirteen to two eighty-two. A brief break of two eighty. Bramo going into the ISM a little bit later this morning, 90 minutes away. It's interesting to see us trade like this ahead of what a lot of people this week considered an important number. I don't really understand it. I'll be honest. I wonder if there's some sort of technical story behind it or some sort of idiosyncratic trading strategy yeah. gone awry or something. I don't understand why people would suddenly have conviction that a recession means the Fed will back away from rate hikes at a time where there does not yeah. seem to be any evidence of uh, inflation cooling off quickly enough to give them faith that they can do that. I hear you. It might go the other way. I've got Priya Misra of TD a little bit later in the next hour who thinks it will. She's targeting 340. She's put a short on. This market's pretty bullish on the front end, at least for now. Lisa, to your point, you would think that if you believe the Federal Reserve is going to keep moving, that it's not the time to buy the two-year. But clearly that conversation has been introduced in the last week or so that we get rate cuts next year, not hikes. So that's the change. Now, TK, bramo has got to run. I'm going to tell Bramo just to leave. She's got to get to the airport, she does, Tom. She does. She's got to get, get to JFK. I can still stay. Just stop She's it. Deciding. Just She's, stop it. Well, You're done. Pretty good. And we're going to go to Pretty Goop. And we'll catch I'll, up with her a little bit later. And can well. we do a phone up I mean, with Lisa, Lisa on the way sure. to JFK? Yeah, sure. We should do no, that. No, no, the Lisa, the stack up at Teterboro is something there. Be sure when you get to Teterboro, the coffee in the terminal in the middle there, there's like six terminals. You would, you would know. The, the, I you know, Lisa, have no just, idea. You know, just G GW Bridge can be hard on the way to Teterboro. Be careful. At least it's not going to that airport. That's where Tom's plane leaves from. Jordan Ryan. Just to with us <laughs> right now, G10 FX strategist <laughs> with you. Nomura uh, right now, and he is going to brief us, and this is the conversation of the day. I want to go to Magnitude, Jordan, and John mentioned your 118 weak pound sterling call, but is Q3 a quarter of magnitude for the major foreign exchange pairs? I think so, Tom. I mean, risk appetite is on the proverbial barbecue, the yakiniku, as we say in Japan. Well, look, when it comes to what's going to happen in the next few months, next month's a key one for Europe. We've got the potential 
for Nord Stream 1 to have its all of its gas supplies cut off. 60% of those gas flows are already cut off. So we're actually just talking about the last 40%. So it's not even that big of a deal now. We've already had the big move lower in the gas flows. That means Germany could consider <coughs> rationing its uh, gas supplies to industry. So that's going to affect Europe in a big way. That's why re recession fears are really picking up, not just in the US, but in right. Europe as well, Tom. And for the UK, it stands out as the main country in, in Europe that hasn't done enough to subsidize the consumer, but also it raised taxes. And then third of all, it has a central bank that is unlike the ECB and unlike the Fed, it's not really being accused of being behind the curve because it's been raising rates for longer since December of last year. So that's why we're already seeing the Bank of England toying with the idea of, well, maybe we don't need to be too hawkish because there is a growth impact. There's a consumer confidence crisis building up. And that's right. why we think cable will go towards 118. And I think early August, <laughs> when the Bank of England disappoints us, Mr. Uh, Carotta, I think they'll do a 25 basis point rate hike instead of 50. Mr. Kuroda was not on Francine Lacroix's uh, market moving panel this week uh, in Centra. Extrapolate sterling weakness over to the magnitude of the move we're going to see in Japanese yen. Tom, the Japanese yen has been really difficult for everyone. Uh, there's two or three things going on. First of all, when U.S. yields go higher, the Japanese yen tends to weaken. Second of all, when oil prices go up, the Japanese yen tends to weaken. Well, now we're having U.S. yields go lower. Now we're having uh, risk off at the same time. That usually leads to uh, Japanese yen strength. And we're having oil prices soften too. So I'm surprised dollar yen is being so calm on a day like this with the rally we're seeing in fixed income. But at the same time, there is a global story about energy prices in the winter coming up where LNG is going to be in big demand. And that's going to really weigh on Japan's trade balance. So short term energy prices might be weak. Uh, it depends where you're looking, because in Europe, gas prices are not weak. They're really accelerating. So I think that's pushing up LNG prices, and that's making it quite difficult for the yen to rally in the environment that we're in, even though we're having this huge fixed income rally today. Jordan, what a tough spot for this ECB, for President Lagarde, for euro dollar. It just feels lose-lose at the moment, Jordan. If they hike, it's a euro weakness story for many people. They anticipate a recession. If they don't hike, it's for all the wrong reasons. It's south of euro. Jordan, is it a lose-lose situation? Can you envision a situation where this euro does get a bid, this euro does rally? There is a way. There is a way. I mean, we're, we're looking for parity, so I don't think that is going to rally. The, the, the view from us is euro is a sell. But I, I, there is a way, which is we find some reason collectively as a market to say global growth expectations are going to turn around. They're going to improve. When that happens, euro goes higher, always, pretty much. Euro is a pro-cyclical currency. So what could lead to that risk on? Well, it could be a ceasefire in Ukraine and Russia. We could see energy prices soften as supply hopes would improve. The other one is China. We have either a large fiscal announcement in China as they are coming out of COVID lockdowns. They might want to do that. Or they might relax their zero COVID policy, allowing more free trade of people, of commodities and so forth in the supply chain. So that could be another way of doing it. Or we see the Fed turn dovish uh, and say, actually, we're not going to raise rates as much as we think. Uh, what we're seeing today, uh, a massive repricing of the US curve. But again, euro dollar is not heading higher. So I think we're in a different framework where we shouldn't be using yields to say where euro dollar is going to go. We should just be using growth expectations once again. So. FX has many different frameworks. The key part is knowing which is the right one to use today. And I think it's that growth framework that is, is the dominant factor for the time being. So, Jordan, with that in mind, how relevant is ECB policy to what happens with the euro? It's definitely relevant. Um, so, for example, we've had some hawks. For, uh, the Lithuanian um, uh, council <laughs> member was saying we could do more than 25 basis points in July. I think that's very unlikely. But if they were to do that, you would get a short-term boost to euro. But we've had bonds go from 0% in March to, I know where they've moved today, but we went up to 180 at one stage. Close to, yeah. The euro fell during that period in those three months. So <clears throat> we went from 112 right. to 104. So higher euro yields, it's not leading to a stronger currency. So it is a bit of a lose-lose for the ECB. They're trying to stop the currency right. weakening. But at the same time, fundamentally, their terms of trade is collapsing. So there's a huge macro driver pushing the euro lower, and the ECB would have to do a lot right. more to improve things, but that would just equal recession. Uh, Jordan, the Little Red Book is not Mao's book of China. It is Stanley Fisher's book, 
from 1998 through the crisis, IMF lessons from a time of crisis. Everybody in the middle of the first decade of this century had to read this uh, in the game. Fisher would say, watch EM. Now, that's away from your remit at Namur, I get. But I'm sorry, Thai bot unraveling. Indonesia, ready to go through 15,000. Filipino with Marcos, looking at 60. What is the symbolism to the developed institutions that EM is unraveling before our eyes? Agreed. We've got basically short EM positions. We're pushing along the dollar Philippines, for example, as a team. It's going to be really difficult for EM to rally in this environment with higher U.S. yields, pushing up the cost of funding for everybody out everywhere. The hope was that tourism flows could support some countries such as Thailand, and that might still be the case, but we could have COVID waves offset that. But in general, if you have peripheral yields in Europe, if you have U.S. credit widening like we are, essentially systemical stress in the credit market is building up. That is just not an environment where emerging markets, especially those with uh, trade deficits, current account deficits, do well. That's just not going to happen. So for the time being, it's quite, from a structural perspective, given our long dollar view that we have in this quarter, I expect um, emerging markets to underperform. You at 75 for the Fed this July. Is that what are looking for? That's it. That's right. So our team, our U.S. economics team, has really hit the nail on the head. They have, I know. With their Fed calls. I think they're going to be right for next year as well. So we have 75 coming up for the next meeting. But let's talk about what we published over the past two weeks. They're calling for a recession next year. They're calling for a recession this year in Q4. That's a lot earlier than other sell-side banks. Um, that's Robert Dent and H.C. San to pushing those views. When it comes to next year, we are pushing also Fed hikes to finish in the, in the first or second quarter. Let's say we get to May. We get to a terminal rate of around 3.5%. And then the Fed starts to cut rates from September onwards, 25 basis points of meeting. And I think that's what the market's doing. It's moving towards the view from our US team today. Jordan, who leads that team? We'll just give them a shout out because they've been great. I did. Robert Dent, I cheat. Those guys have really yeah. pushed the view really well. Awesome. Jordan, thank you, buddy. As always, Jordan Rochester mm -hmm. of Nomura. They were talking about 75 long before anyone was talking about yes. 75. Yeah. Credit where it's due. I'll share this with you. Tom, you might know this already. One of my favorite functions on the Bloomberg terminal, WCRS Go. Just gives you a snapshot of foreign exchange. You can select where in foreign exchange, G10, the commodity currencies, emerging markets, whatever you want. Do EM year to date, and something's going to surprise you here. I'll go through the weakness, the underperformers, the Turkish lira down 21%, the Argentine peso down 18%, the Hungarian foreign down, let's call it 16 the Polish slotty down 11%. Tom, the best performing EM currency year to date. Do you know what it is? I'm guessing Brazil. Close. That's number two. The ruble. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't By even, a margin, I don't even a look at EM as, as Russia's EM. I look at them as frontier. They're like Ghana to me. You want to call it frontier now? Yeah, I would call Russia frontier. You've downgraded frontier. them. It's such an, odd, such an odd economy. You know, the thing that Nomura does is they call all their fellow employees the, the Japanese thing, San. You know, I, I, I'm going to miss Brahma-san here. Brahma-san. Brahma-san's Brahma -san. gone. Sweet. Yeah, I'm going to miss She's her. She's on her way to the airport, Tom. Yeah. I might oh. try and get a phone her in. A phone interview in the next hour with Bramo we on the way to JFK. Well, that would be fun, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, I thought she's going to Teterboro. I'm sorry. That's for you. We live very different okay. lifestyles compared to you, Tom. Can That's we where talk about Bitcoin? From. Please John, do. Go. Bitcoin's got to get to Tuesday. And I really don't know, given the financial and regulatory interest, it's a complete mystery to me how Bitcoin gets a bid. I read this weekend of Bitcoin mining at Seneca Lake John, which is beautiful, up in upstate New York, and they're arguing over doing mining there because they're going to heat up the water and all that. And, John, I just I just don't get it. Do you know what I struggle with, Tom? They don't get just the idea they don't get a break, that that thing carries on trading through the weekend. Yeah. I mean, come that's, on. That's the point. I mean, what, what time the... are we closing the bond market to? <clears throat> 2 p.m.? Yeah. And, and crypto's going through the weekend. I don't know. i got to find a new song to sing here as we go another 20 well, minutes. Well, bonus round. I'll be with bonus you in the next round. segment, so I yeah. can't wait. Futures down a quarter of 1% like on the S&P. Bonds rallying. We're down nine basis points on 10s, 292. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. The Iran nuclear talks are likely to resume after President Biden's trip to the region this month. An intention 
round of discussions in Qatar failed to overcome differences between the U.S. and the Islamic Republic. The 2015 nuke agreement offered Iran sanctions relief in return for curbs to its nuclear program. Donald Trump pulled out of the deal back in 2018 and reimposed sanctions. And the stage is set for the ECB to raise interest rates this month for the first time in more than a decade. Inflation in the Eurozone rose higher than expected to a record last month. Consumer prices jumping 8.4% from a year ago. Once again, they were driven by those soaring costs for both food and energy. China's President Xi Jinping defended his crackdown on Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement in a landmark speech marking the 25th anniversary of Chinese rule. Xi said the former British colony should focus on its economic development. He said Hong Kong has entered a new stage of moving from chaos to governance. And a labor contract for 22,000 U.S. West Coast dock workers is on the verge of expiring. But both sides appear willing to avoid strikes, lockouts or work stoppages during the busiest season of the year for shipping. The current agreement between the Dock Workers Union and more than 70 employers ends today. A deal before the deadline is unlikely. Americans will buy more fireworks than last year to celebrate the 4th of July. The industry is prepared for that, boosting imports by 27%. But buyers may get sticker shock. Prices are expected to be up about 30%. Transportation costs have been a big part of that increase. Fireworks need more space for safety precautions. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. traders how are you doing today um, I'm going to place an order a new short order to sell uh, Japanese yen the price I'm looking to sell 135.34 okay if you're looking to sell a Japanese yen here is your chance to sell at 135.34 just below as you can see it is doji candlestick okay uh place your order stay with me as soon as we will get filled um i will guide you through this order or maybe just maybe um you don't want to trade this uh forex pair uh, the reason uh you might not trade because we probably will hold for several days we have as you can see from our open position we have several positions open already on uh, japanese yen we have a quite big account we trade for other clients um money so uh because it's short position first of all we don't pay overcharge uh, overnight ch uh, prices broker pays us so it's kind of we're not losing anything at all we are able to hold this position and we never sell loss uh, in loss any positions for years so uh if you want to trade japanese yen all you have to do you have to calculate um the uh, price uh, stop loss when you're going to place it after when it will move to your advantage so in this case if it will move let's say to uh, 20 pips to your advantage it's better to put uh, around five seven pips uh, stop loss so in this case, if uh, the price will move against you, you will close position. Because for several months, uh, Japanese yen was losing its stake uh, against United States dollar. And as you can see, we're holding at a low, lower level. We was opening short positions, short positions, short positions. Every time it was moving higher and higher. 
So in your case, we will hold this position until we will have decent profit. In your case, if you will see the price will move in your advantage 20 pips, please place your stop loss on um, for your position 7 pips in your advantage. Okay, guys, I'll speak to you later. Stay safe. Let's take its next giant leap. Stocked early enough all these precious materials you were just mentioning and we were on the lucky side that our prognosis was spot on in a way uh, forecasting what kind of uh, material we would need and uh, what quantity we would need. Consumers going to have a big summer. Uh, people getting out and uh, doing all the things they haven't been able to do for the last couple of years. Over time, that that cushion will get spent, uh, and and in particular in this environment, inflation will erode uh, the purchasing power to a degree. But Stephen Stanley, there, the chief economist at Amherst Pierpont on this economy. If you were looking for a quiet end or quiet start, quiet end to the week, quiet start to Q3, going into a long weekend, we're not getting it. We're down about a quarter of 1% on the S&P. Got a big move in the bond market to talk about. Yields down 11 basis points. Thomas, a break of 290 on a 10-year, 289.86. And that's not the only news out there. We're waiting for news from GM. Trading halted, Tom, news pending from General yeah, Motors. And, and no other information whatsoever. We're going to do what we do, which is aggregate the news flow, and there's nothing to aggregate. I just don't see, Zero, I don't see anything on Twitter. Nada. Nothing from a legitimate source. We're not going to speculate. Uh, but there, it's a big deal. I'm sorry, GM, let me read it exactly. General Motors halted for news pending. We will wait for the news. We will we'll see what that news is. There's nothing else much to say. <coughs> Tom, I can talk about the front end of this yield curve, down 14 basis points, 281. Right. Looking ahead to the ISM in about an hour and 12 minutes from now, anticipating maybe some weaker data no. and this conversation about not rate hikes, but maybe rate cuts in our future. Fractional curve steepening, I'm going to go with, but mostly it's just a yield compression. And equities haven't played. It'll be really interesting to see after 10 a.m. off that key economic data. Um, I'm with you, Tom. We'll Tom, that's see. such a good point. Equities haven't paid. They haven't played haven't at all, played. considering what we're seeing develop in the bond market. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to see. We'll continue to watch General uh, Motors. Right now, what we're going to do is cover airlines here and all the uproar. And we're not going to do the gossip that's out there. Everybody's having a field day uh, with us. We're going to try to get some clarity thought. We are going to go to Nashville, Tennessee, which is the franchise of Raymond James. But first, we've got Kriti Gupta with us at LGA. It is a spanking new, hugely successful rebuild of LaGuardia, worst airport in the world, according to any number of studies. And boy, have they turned that around. Uh, Kriti, it's not the panic of two days ago, is it? It's not the panic of two days ago, Tom. I think the story here is going to be the trade-off between the airline story and the gasoline, the driving story. I mean, you talk to people here, even flight attendants here, and they're saying, well, all the rush, all the chaos, it happened earlier in the week because everyone already got out of town. If you actually look at what the research is saying, AAA actually said that this weekend it's going to be the slowest holiday weekend going all the way back to 2011. It's going to be the busiest holiday weekend for driving, the second busy, I should say, going all the way back to 2000. So it's very clear that people right. are looking at airfare. They're saying it's too expensive, and they're driving instead. Pretty one quick question here. You've got all eyes all the time on your Texas as well. What's the anecdote you get of DFW? Well, I'll tell you right now, in the last about hour since we've been here, we walked in, no flights were canceled. We came checked again an hour later. Three flights are canceled. Two of them were out of DFW Airport. And really what it go. tells you anecdotally, Tom, about a month ago I was there. <laughs> DFW is a international airport. It's also a major domestic hub. So the traffic, uh, the flight attendant shortage, the pilot shortage, it's almost magnified in that particular spot. Pretty good to thank you so much at LaGuardia in New York. Now we go to Nashville. Savvy sits with us, uh, Airlines Managing Director at Raymond James. You're writing for Tuesday, Savvy. What are you going to write about Tuesday about this air Airline chaos. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know what I would say is, it, from a cancellation rate, it, we operationally airlines are having a harder time, but they have proactively taken down schedules. So what we've been writing has been consistent, I think, for the last uh, several weeks, and, and it will be consistent on Tuesday, which is that 
operationally, airlines would love to fly more. Uh, there's definitely more demand than there are flights today. Uh, e even with maybe some consumers choosing to drive, there's just still too much demand for the, the amount of supply airlines can put out there. But they have taken it back because they want to maintain decent operations. And if you look at cancellation rates, we're probably trending only one point higher, one percentage point higher than, than it, it was pre-pandemic. So they're, they're doing enough ahead of time to try and offset some of the, the pain that comes with the, 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 you know, the current operational environment. Sanva, you're speaking to something that I don't think gets talked about enough, the difficulty of ramping up capacity in this industry, even if you want to the amount of regulation that requires the certain amount of trading, how long it takes to onboard people to get them to operate in the airports. Can you run through that for us, Sabi? just how difficult it is to build out capacity and build out an employee, as a force, a labor force for some of these companies? It's just tremendously difficult, isn't it? It is. And, and last year you saw, you know, across the ecosystem, airlines having problems, um, you know, not just airlines, their partners and airports as well. I think this year... A lot of that is is under control. They've learned lessons. They've they've hired ahead of time, um, but the 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 biggest bottleneck is on the pilot side. We've had a lot of pilot retirements uh, during the the pandemic when you didn't know if demand was going to come back, and now that demand has come back really strong, you're trying to hire and put pilots in the cockpit as quickly as possible. But it is a longer time horizon. It's bigger than they used to be. Uh, pre-pandemic and trying to get the, those pilots through and into the cockpit in time for uh, to fly the capacity. Savvy, I've got 30 seconds on the clock. Clearly, they are reluctant to build out capacity, not just <clears throat> unable to build out capacity. There is a worry now about whether this so-called revenge spend on travel persists through the rest of this year. What's baked into your numbers on that one? Yeah, we're assuming a slowdown, but the, the key here is because the capacity is so much below demand, even if demand comes down, maybe that just gives you some, some relief there. So yields might be lower, fares might come down, uh, but but generally we think you know it's, it's still a strong environment for airlines, even with some pullback here in, in demand into the fall and maybe into next year. Savvy, awesome. As always, Savvy Sither of Raymond James on the travel industry, the airlines, TKGM, headline just out. Yeah. They see second quarter net income at 1.6 billion to 1.9. Just seeing that number across the Bloomberg right now. This is in real time, folks. We'll do much more on this on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television here. I've just brought up, and again, all of this at the speed of modern digital. Uh, John, this is the 8K form. It's a substantial uh, form, and it's loaded with numbers, and we'll have to go into the one, two, three uh, major paragraphs. Uh, Time uh, again, semiconductor shipments, John, and other supply side uh, disruptions 95,000 vehicles in inventory. We'll talk about it in the next hour. On the next hour on Bloomberg TV, Mohammed Al Arian, Mike Wilson, Priya Misra, Luke Cower. What a lineup we've got to get you through the first trading day of Q3 from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to another special Wimbledon update for Bloomberg TV and radio from Tennis Channel. I'm Erin Coscarelli. Rafael Nadal remains on course for the calendar slam after day four of the championships in London. The Spaniard took care of business against Ricardo Barrinkas under the roof on center court to advance to the third round and a meeting against Italy's Lorenzo Sinego. After his wins in Paris and Melbourne, Rafa is looking for his third major title of the year and to extend his lead over Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic in the all-time list at the Slams. And American Coco Goff also advancing, the 19-year-old getting past Mihaela Buzernescu to reach round three. Coco can make her second straight championship match at the Slams after finishing runner-up at Roland Garros earlier this year. And don't forget, Tennis Channel's daily coverage from London all starts 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Erin Coscarelli.
prices and a short supply of key chemicals that produce synthetic fertilisers are sending pig, cow and horse manure prices soaring. Even human waste is in demand as farmers hunt for alternatives. Fertiliser helps increase crop yields. You can see how much moisture is held into this. It's, it's a lot of organic material into the uh, compost. So it breaks down the manure and the straw breaks down into a friable mix that can be mixed into your, your, your soil in the ground and, and for growing a whole range of different vegetables. Holds the nutrients in, holds the water in, um, and it really in increases the, uh, the kind of biodynamic profile of the soil. The recent price spike could mean more farmers going organic for the long term. Front row, exclusive interviews with the most influential figures in finance. Lloyd Blankfein. Deflation is a terrible thing. Inflation you could tolerate. Kathy Wood. Tesla will be in the pole position to dominate. Jeremy Grantham. We've had a very, very abnormal honeymoon Goldilocks period. First available on the Bloomberg Terminal, then on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg.com. Front row, the best seats in the house for business's greatest minds. Q3 started with a big move in this bond market. Yields lower. Equities just a little bit softer. From New York City, the countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg, the open with Jonathan Farrow. from New York City, we begin with the big issue. Here come the downgrades. Economists have begun to cut their top-down economic forecasts for GDP. We're looking at an economy losing momentum faster than you know what we anticipated. Input costs have risen substantially. We've had the two biggest quarters of inventory build. We're seeing demand destruction in some areas. The consumer is on somewhat more fragile footing. We're starting to see this economy slow. We do expect the Fed to hike rates more aggressively. Companies and consumers need to get ready. Frankly, we think they can keep going. There's a change in the underlying economy. We did see some pretty notable down, downward revisions. We just don't see how, how we don't get an, uh, a recalibration here. We expect more downgrades. We've seen some already. We expect more. We're getting clear signs of slowing. Brilliant lineup this morning, and we begin with Mohammed Al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, I want to start with this question, and thank you for being with us. Is the economic pain we're starting to feel the market volatility we've witnessed through the year so far, is that a feature or a bug for this Fed? It's a, um, how do I put it? Um, it is an irritation, I suspect, for the Fed. Look, the Fed has been driving the car looking through the rearview mirror. So the Fed now is fully, unconditionally fighting inflation, but it's going to aggressively hike into a slowing economy. And that's the combination that the market is worried about. And what we're seeing playing out, John, virtually every day for the last few days is not just interest rate risk. That's become less of a concern. It's now about credit risk and liquidity risk. Or in other words, it's about an economic recession and it's about the difficulties companies will, may face in getting new capital. And we've seen this in the credit market, Mohammed. so let's talk about it. Investment-grade spreads, 150. High yield spreads through 550. 
570. We're seeing it with triple C spreads, as you might expect, 1,000 basis points. This is not late 2018 where the Fed could back away and they started to see these numbers. Mohammed, this is a different story, as you know, and we all know. I'm trying to work out where there is a tipping point. Is there a tipping point in this credit market where you think the Fed looks around and says, maybe we need to rethink here? If there is, John, we're not anywhere near it. Um, the Fed now is focused on inflation, and that's the big difference with 2018. When you don't have inflation in the system, you can respond to what's happening in the credit market. When you have inflation in the system, it's much harder to respond. And I think the message was crystal clear from this week's um, remarks by central bankers. They worried about inflation getting entrenched, rightly so. So I think the notion that the Fed will blink early this time based on credit issues um, is, is not likely to happen. I do think, and you and I have discussed this, that we face the risk of a flip-flopping Fed in a few months when they realize that the economy has slowed, but inflation is still not under control. You wrote in the FT this week, not just a flip-flopping Fed, the risk of a multi-round flip-flopping Fed. Mohammed, walk me through that. What pushes the Fed to stop, start, stop, start, and create even more volatility and more problems? Lack of conviction and lack of a proper understanding of what the economy is doing, and therefore, lack of credibility. That is the history of the 70s and the 80s, where you end up having this flip-flopping phenomenon among central banks, and it's problematic because by the time you come out of it, you've solved neither for growth nor for inflation. And that's where you get whipsawed and markets get whipsawed. I can go through all the quotes from all the banks right now. They're cutting their growth forecast. Morgan Stanley, overnight, they've made a move for 2022. They now see US GDP growth at 0.9%, fourth quarter, fourth quarter. They've previously seen 1.4. Goldman came out, Jan Hatzis and the team, lowering their GDP forecast, their tracking estimate by one percentage point for Q2 to just 1.9%. Some people are expecting something a whole lot worse. Nomura coming out, sounding the alarm, calling for a global contraction, saying the following. In addition to the US, we now expect recessions in the Eurozone, UK, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, all of those places, all of those regions, countries, in recession for all of them. Mike McKee, there's some big calls coming from some big banks in the last 24 hours. Yeah, and I can tell you the reason why in one chart, everybody is following the economy and it's hard to boil it down to one forecast, but if, if there is one everybody looks at, it's the Atlanta Fed GDP now numbers, and they have now gone negative for the second quarter. They say we're looking at a 1% contraction. That would be the second contraction in a row uh, quarterly for the U.S., and you can see the blue line there. That's financial conditions, and that's one big difference between now and maybe the 70s, 80s is the markets know what the Fed's going to do. The markets are front-running it. They didn't know in the 70s and 80s. Look how fast financial conditions have changed. And so that has led to forecast changes and this change, a change in the way people are looking at what the Fed is going to do next. We've already got rate cuts priced into our WIRP function. And take a look on the left-hand side there. That's the forecast for what they're going to do at the July 27th meeting. And it has come down. It was firmly at 75 basis points. Now it's moving down a little bit. Are people going to start discounting the possibility of maybe the uh, Fed going back a little bit. That will depend on what happens with some of the data next week, including Friday. Friday, the big day, of course, with jobs. And we are expecting a slowdown. 250,000 jobs is the consensus right now. We'll have to somehow get through the week without the ADP report, because that's been placed on hiatus. It's that a bit of sarcasm there, Mike. Yeah, that's a Just bit a of sarcasm bit. there. But uh, we do have the ISM manufacturing numbers today. That'll play into it big. We'll look at what the employment numbers are in that. And the same thing with ISM services. And of course, everybody's going to be watching the Fed minutes next Wednesday, but it all culminates Friday with payrolls, and that may have a big effect on what people think is going to happen in the end of July when the Fed meets again. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Going into the long weekend. Shortened trading day as well for the bond market, but wow, are we seeing a move in this bond market? Down 15 basis points on twos, 280. On a five-year, down 17 basis points, 286. On a 10-year, down 14, sub 290. Never mind sub three, 287. Mohammed. Come back in here on the bond market. Talk to me about it. Your view on this flip-flopping Fed and how you think the bond market's going to pick up on that story. 
So again, the bond market is leading the Fed. The bond market led the Fed on, on rate hikes. It took a long time for the Fed to recognize that there was an inflation problem, that they needed to hike. And now the, the bond market once again is saying, whoa, wait, look at what's happening to the real economy. What I find really interesting, John, is that even though we've had this massive move in bond yields in the U.S., the dollar is stronger today. We are back at levels that we haven't seen since November of 2002. And what that tells you is that the market is even more worried about growth outside the U.S. than it is here, and that the U.S. is still viewed as a safe haven. So this is not just a U.S. story. But as you read out from some of the quotes, this is a global story. Mohammed, this feels like a new phase in this story of the market so far this year. It's not the same as what dominated the front half. It was pain in stocks, pain in bonds. Can you walk me through where you think this new phase in this market regime is going? Yeah, John, and, and you know, I've found very simple construct are really helpful. And the simple construct I've had is the sequential move from inflation stroke interest rate risk to credit risk, to possibly liquidity risk. So the first, most of the first quarter was about inflation interest rate risk. And there, everything sells off, unless you are a commodity and you have supply side issues. But that's why your 60-40 portfolio was so harmful. The minute interest rate risk is mostly priced in and credit risk comes, back, comes in, which is what has happened over the last few weeks, suddenly, the correlations between bonds and stocks, the traditional correlations, when the price of one goes up, the price of the other one comes down, regains its footing. And investors have some risk mitigation, but then the impact is mainly on equities and on swap, on spreads. And the one risk I'm really worried about is liquidity risk. And we're starting to see markets locked out of funding and keep a very close eye. Issuance in June was very low. Companies either were unwilling or unable to, refi to refinance themselves. So we need to look at issuance and make sure that that doesn't freeze up. I was going through some of those numbers on the issuance side, and it's pretty dreadful for high yield. It's pretty dreadful for other parts of the market as well. When you talk about liquidity, Mohammed, can you just put a bit more detail on that, some more color? Are you expecting liquidity problems to be where you'd expect traditionally for there to be liquidity problems or liquidity problems to turn up in places where there should be liquidity? So, you know, on my radar screens are three sets of potential, I want to stress potential liquidity strength. One is in peripheral markets that somehow contaminate the main markets. So far, crypto hasn't. So far, EM hasn't, but keep an eye on that. The second type of risk is simply the inability to raise funding at any cost. And again, we've seen high yield go through this, but high yield is less important than if we, it migrates up the quality ladder. And then the final one, John, which I'm surprised people aren't talking about, we would have expected major rebalancing flows by now to help equities. And we haven't seen that. So is it that they're being offset by outflows? Or is it that investors are less willing to rebalance in favor of risk asset? We don't know, but it is notable that we haven't seen the sort of rebalancing effects that you would expect after a quarter like we've seen in the second quarter. What a quarter it's been. What a first half it's been as well. Mohammed, awesome. As always, a clinic from you, Mohammed. Al Arian from Gramercy and, of course, Queen's College, Cambridge. And Bloomberg Opinion too, Mohammed. We appreciate your time, sir, as always. Just brought up those issuance numbers on the junk bond side of things. New bond sales, a modest 9.7 billion. The slowest June since 2010 for junk issuance. The first half supply, the slowest since 2009. Just something to think about. Coming up, equity strategists seeing further downside after the worst first half since 1970. We need to see the market get much more comfortable with earnings expectation before you get maybe a more tradable uh, bottom. But that's not where we are now. That conversation up next.
When you think of cutting edge technology at sea, you might be thinking of stuff like this. But there's an incoming revolution on the high seas that isn't quite as sexy, but could be significantly more impactful. Container shipping is the key component of global trade. About 80 or 90% of all the world's goods are transported at sea at some point. But there's a significant unseen cost to the modern era of global commerce. About 3% of all the world's CO2 emissions come from shipping. 3% may not sound like a lot, but that's roughly comparable to the entire CO2 output of Germany. Since reducing trade isn't a likely option, what about a technological improvement to help reduce the emissions from these well-stocked maritime behemoths? market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. That's going to be the best question I get all night. I'm glad you asked that. Bloomberg Television. Top experts. Great questions. Typically, it, it peaks at about 10% in the cycle. Right now, it's high eights. So I would say that's 10-ish, maybe somewhere around there, but nowhere near current levels. The Fed's looking right now at the tightening conditions and saying, yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it's painful, but this is a feature. It's not a bug. This is a feature. It's not a bug. The quote of the week from Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo, and one of the reasons that Goldman is defensive over the next three months, but more optimistic, constructive over the next 12. Goldman's Christian Miller Glissman writing the following. We remain relatively defensive for three months. We look for opportunities to add risk for 12 months. While the likelihood of a recession has increased, we wouldn't expect it to be deep or prolonged. TD's Priya Misra, Luke Carr of UBS joins us right now. Priya, I want to go straight to your call on short two-year treasuries targeting 340 on a two-year on a morning where we've got a monster bit at the front end of the curve, down 14 basis points to 280. Help me understand your position right now, Priya. Sure. So we've had this monster bid for the last week. You know, it, it sort of accelerated the last couple of days. I will say that the market's less liquid. So small amount of flow is having an exaggerated reaction. So I think we shouldn't get too caught up on the daily moves. But overall, I think the market is a little more relaxed about inflation. I'm not sure why, because we've seen very persistently high inflation numbers, which we expect is going to remain with us for a while. And the market's expecting the Fed to respond and not hike as much. And that's why we've actually seen even just July meeting odds go from 75 basis points, which was priced in two weeks ago, to now 65 and beyond. The end point of the hiking cycles declined significantly. I think there's a couple of issues. I think the economy is slowing and the Fed is saying that's collateral damage. I mean, as you said, feature. It is a feature of tightening policy. I don't think they respond and they're looking at inflation. And what they're telling us is there's an unconditional commitment to put that inflation genie back in the bottle. Inflation expectations, headline inflation, you know, not just PCE. And therefore, I think if inflation stays high, which is our view, and growth remains okay, I mean, we're looking for 350 on payrolls next week, which is a strong number, unemployment rate remaining unchanged, the market will have to reprice that Fed hiking cycle. I mean, we can be really worried about growth end of next year, but I think for the next six months, it's still the inflation problem that the Fed has to deal with, and I don't think they blink. The market's pricing in that Fed blinking in the next few months, and I think it's it's premature for that. Priya, you're looking for 4% on Fed funds, a full handle. Luke Cower, does any of that resonate with you? Well, one thing that does definitely resonate with us is that you know, high inflation means slower growth going forward. And that's, you know, that's, I think, one of our themes continuing for not just the next three to six months, but uh, but also beyond that. And I think where some of the focus is maybe uh, a little different from Priya's, we've been focusing a little more just on the long end of the curve and getting more constructive there. And the, the thought has basically been since, you know, since the latest FOMC meeting, that seems to be when, you know, the, the dam has burst, so to speak, in that we were always thinking, okay, when do you price in enough tightening so that you really start to get cuts 
in the back end priced in in a way that provides a little more support in the long end. Uh, that's one thing that's changed in a big way. So for example, you know, after the May meeting and then the run up to the June meeting, you had anywhere from, from 20 to 40 basis points of cuts from the end of 2022 through the start of 2024 priced in. And now we're at over 80 there. So the market is effectively pricing in, not the Fed blinking as, as soon as Priya suggests, I, I think, but definitely doing enough damage to the economy that they're forced to reverse course. And that's something that uh, puts a bit of a better floor under the long end is, is something that we've been we've been thinking of lately. So bonds are back, Luke, for you and the team, potentially at the long end, tens, maybe longer than that. Can you help me understand the equity side of the position for you too? Are you less constructive there as you get more constructive on the bond side? Yeah, certainly on the on the equity side, I think the you know cheap phrase, but the stocks have uh, you know gone uh, stocks have gone down, stocks have sold off, but stocks are not on sale. It's uh, it's still just the fact that if you're looking at them relative to bonds uh, on a cross asset basis, stocks just still not are not that attractive to buy. And then you have to consider. Okay, what should uh, quote unquote valuations be in this growth backdrop? Well, we have a growth backdrop where the Fed is telling you they want slower growth. Uh, Europe certainly isn't prioritizing growth for, for geopolitical reasons right now. And, and China, although we, we believe there the, the situation has improved and uh, you know there's a bit of a better balance between growth and public health outcomes, public health outcomes still come first. So in the US, Europe, and China, growth is not a priority. How can equity investors think that uh, you know growth estimates and earnings estimates are going to hold up that well in an environment where three kind of major pillars of the global economy are telling you that that's not really at the, at the top of their list right now? So to our view, it's it's that the right now the the level of equity risk premium aren't justifying uh, the kind of likely downside risk to earnings from here, and that's something that you know as we expect, whether it's you know this earnings season or in the run up to it, that you might start to see just those headline EPS estimates start to roll over. Because normally, in any kind of downturn of this magnitude, it uh, it doesn't end before you at least get some trimming to EPS estimates. Certainly, we won't be we won't be waiting for EPS estimates to completely bottom, but we would like to see kind of the analyst community just get more on board. And I think uh, one thing you've seen in recent earnings announcements is that uh, you know this EPS downside is not yet priced in. That's yep. why the stocks are having significant reactions. We've heard a ton of that on this program over the last couple of weeks, particularly from Lisa Shannon and Morgan Stanley. We'll catch up with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley in about 20 minutes' time. Priya, with the economic backdrop that Luke just described, that doesn't sound like a world where inflation expectations can remain elevated. You'd expect them to get hammered. Why do you think you should still own tips in the world that Luke just described? Sure. So I think long and inflation expectations can decline and they have been declining. Where I struggle with is the very front end. You know, I know oil prices have fallen, some commodity prices have fallen, but you look at gasoline, you look at what's impacting U.S. consumers, those numbers are still high. Food prices are high. Shelter, I mean, shelter is a lagging indicator of home prices. Home prices were up 20% the last two years. So we think rent inflation will continue to rise. With mortgage rates rising, it's a little bit perverse, but actually more people might rent than buy. So when I look at CPI forecast, us for the rest of the year into early next year, we have very high CPI estimates. And so the very front end of the tips market is attractive. For anyone that is owning risk assets, I would say own some tips break evens because the biggest risk to your portfolio is that inflation comes in high. The Fed is committed. They just told us they are unconditionally committed. They're going to keep hiking creating a more negative backdrop for the economy, for your assets a year from now, the only hedge really are front-end inflation-protected securities because those just get a lot of carry when when inflation numbers are high. So it's much more a near-term, like one-year, two-year tips is what I would own, just to position for inflation that's not as volatile. And it's been very hard to predict, and it has come in persistently higher than anyone's been forecasting Fed, uh, you know, uh, sell-side economists, I think there's still more room in that inflation trade to keep running. Priya, in what way does a short and a two-year and a long in tips complement each other? Because I would have thought that if you believe we get to 4% on Fed funds and your short two is up to 340, then in that world, inflation expectations just get hammered. And so does inflation protection. Why do tips work no, and the short twos point. work? How does that work? Fair point. I think that's in the long end. The issue is the Fed, I know, is focused on inflation, headline inflation. They don't have a whole lot of control on many parts of inflation, whether it's shelter, whether it's um, food, energy. And so I think they can raise rates a lot, but does it really impact inflation in the near term? The other issue is monetary policy lags. And this has been my issue with the Fed reaction function, but they're responding to realized inflation. 
which is not going to respond to policy right now. And so I think until they become model driven or outlook driven, I think they're going to run the risk of driving, looking at the rear view mirror because they are looking at inflation that's actually responding to growth and monetary policy a year ago. So the lags, the fact that Fed policy actually doesn't affect large parts of inflation and it affects... Okay, guys, as you can see, position opened on Japanese yen at 135.34. Okay, if you want to trade, like I said, you still have chance to enter position because it moved higher. In our case, we sold short. Uh, we opened a contract for uh, to sell uh, short Japanese yen. Okay, guys, stay safe, and I'll speak to you later. Ali, if the economy does slow down more than we're looking for, like a recession next year. I think that long end has a lot more room to go. So a flattening of the, of the yield curve, inversion of the yield curve is what I would call it. Freya, the world that you describe for equity investors sounds horrifying. Fed funds at four and inflation persisting. What a call. Priya Misra, the TD, thank you. Luke Cowher of UBS, the him and the team, thank you very much. Up next, the morning calls and later, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. Futures negative two tenths of one percent. Here are your morning calls. First up, Berenberg downgrading FedEx to hold, waiting for the macroeconomic outlook to improve. Bank of America downgrading Micron to neutral, highlighting signs of weakening demand. And finally, JP Morgan reiterating its overweight on Apple, expecting better supply dynamics to overwhelm a modest decline in demand. Up next, one of the best on the street is Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley on the equity market pain of the first half of 22 and what's in store for the second half. You're opening bell. This Friday morning, up next.
think space, you probably think one space agency that travels under the radar is ESA. Which is surprising considering what the European Space Agency has achieved and how vital it is to the global space industry. We've collaborated with pretty much everybody who is involved in space exploration. But ESA wants to be a leading force in furthering humanity's mission into space. Commander Crown, do you copy? Copy. If we want to have successful human missions to Mars, we are going to have to learn to live and work off-world in a different way. The place where we are going to learn to do that is on the moon. Can ESA help humanity take its next giant leap? to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. Let's get the final trading day of the week started. The first day of Q3 started so you can get to your long weekend stateside. Futures negative two tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by four tenths of 1%. On the Russell, futures negative two tenths of 1% following the worst first half since 1970 on the S&P. Here's your second half. That's your opening bounce. Switch up the board. Your bond market looks like this. There's a big bid this morning. Yields are lowered by 13 basis points on a 10-year. You thought sub-3% was new. Try sub-290. 288.76. We're down 12 or 13 basis points right now. Euro dollar negative 8 tenths of 1%, even with an inflation surprise, an upside positive surprise. Call it negative. Call it what you will. We are higher on inflation in Europe, 8.6%, and the euro is clinging to 104. Dollar strength is a story this morning. Yields lower, dollar strength. It speaks to concerns about global growth. But look at crude. It doesn't speak to that at all, up 2.6%. This is the cause, the cause of some of these issues, 108.50 on WTI. That's a story around the open about 40 seconds in. Let's strip this back and get you some movers and get to the West Coast and catch up with Ed. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Zeroed in on Micron forecasting weaker than expected sales in the quarter. The maker of DRAM or memory chips really focus on this because it's kind of a barometer of consumer demand. The concern being that demand for smartphones, PCs slowing down. That stock down 2.8% at the open. Apple interesting up two tenths of 1%. There was concern that the read through from Micron was that demand was waning. But as you said, John, there's also an improving supply picture, which the street is hoping will outweigh its supply crunch concerns. Coles, wow, look at that, down 18 point. 2%. Coles board walking away from a deal to sell the company for $8 billion to Franchise Group. They basically said Franchise's group offer reflects the current retail and financing environment, but it would not be prudent to proceed with the given market volatility that we're seeing. So that stock down big. And Delta Airlines, just one airline that we're looking at in particular, made many that are rising up 1%. A report that American Airlines has offered its pilots a 17% pay boost for contracts, John, a report out overnight. Interesting ahead of the long weekend because I think we're all hoping there are enough pilots to get us from A to B. We're catching up with Kriti Gupta a little bit later. She's at LaGuardia. Good. She's going to talk about those airlines in just a moment. Ed, just quickly, GM, yeah. your thoughts on what yeah. took place about 30 minutes ago. Initially, when it was halted, news pending, you're expecting something big. I'm not sure we got something big. What did we get? Yeah, mixed picture. Two pieces of news, really. Basically, a second quarter profit warning below consensus on net income. But what they said was really interesting on the semiconductor side. They have 95,000 vehicles in inventory that they're not able to shift or sell because they're missing chips 
essentially. Now, they did reaffirm full-year guidance, which is important. They're basically saying even though they can't sell those 95K vehicles right now, they'll catch up at the end of the year. But what a contrast, John, with Micron, right? Different pockets of the chip sector that have different levels of tightness. Ed, thank you, sir, as always. About two minutes into this, we're negative two-tenths of 1%. Energy top of the pile up nine tenths of one percent on energy equities off the back of the rally you see in the commodity market at the moment. Try and find financials for you near the bottom of the pile, down a third of one percent. The banks aren't going to enjoy what's happening in this bond market right now, that's for sure. Although the banks haven't enjoyed anything that's happened in this bond market for the year so far, and yields have been rocketed higher. For retail, there is a problem, and it's easier to see. Pimco's Aaron Brown weighing in earlier this week. What inflation keeps taking higher on are those necessities, and that's ultimately what's going to, you know, create a, a shallow consumer recession. We're already, I think, in an Amazon recession right now. We've already seen retail goods, um, durable goods spending start to roll over, and I think that that's, you know, an early canary in the coal mine for what's to come, you know, in the broader economy. We're in an Amazon recession right now. Her view. Katie Greifout joins us now for more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, like Aaron Brown said, I mean, if you're spending more on necessities, you don't have much left for the discretionary spends. And that what we saw play out in the first half in the consumer discretionary sector, losing one-fourth of its value in the second quarter alone. You had just three of 58 stocks in that index in the green, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, and AutoZone. That says something. And the losses there in that sector, big reason why the S&P 500 shed nearly $9 trillion in market cap in the first half. If you break that into sectors, of course, tech had the most to lose, shaving about $3.3 trillion. Up next, though, are those discretionary stocks, that sector losing almost $2 trillion in value. And John, as you know well, this is all about inflation. You have costs on everything going up, especially the essentials, home, shelter, energy, airfare, all soaring in cost. Again, John, not a lot of budget left for those discretionary spends. Katie, what a year it's been so far. You've got six more months of it. Katie Can't Greifel, wait. Thank you. That's my pitch for the rest of the year, I know. Let's hope it gets better. What a year it's been so far. We're trying to turn the page on a messy first half. This is the point of great uncertainty. Uncertainty. Big uncertainties. Uncertainty around inflation. Some significant changes since the pandemic. Transition point in the market. How far rates are going to have to rise. The Fed acted way too late. For the second half of the year, the big question now we have is on growth. The question is now on earnings. Margins must come down. The market will have to fall further. Volatility is likely to persist. We don't see the uncertainty in the other markets going away. We need a different strategy. We still have a long road ahead. New half, same uncertainty. Morgan Stanley expecting equity declines to continue, writing the following. Falling yields and lower oil prices have lowered the terminal rate for the Fed. Last week, the market took the bullish view, which may last a few more weeks before the reality of lower earnings arrives and the bear market resumed. I'm pleased to say a good friend of this program joins us right now. It's Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. And what a year you're having, Mike. Let's start right there. You wrote it going into last weekend. A lower yield, bullish or bearish, yields are lower today, talk to me. Yeah, hey John, it's always good to be with you. Happy 4th of July weekend. Um, we get a little extra day of break here from uh, from the volatility. But look, I mean, I think it is playing out uh, very much as we expected this year with the, with the fire and ice combination. Now, the first half, though, is all about the fire, right? It's all about inflation. Um, it's all about the Fed catching up uh, to where they need to be to, you know, slow things down. And of course, now the second half is going to be about the slowdown. And so, you know, rates moving lower is not about the Fed pausing or giving up on their, you know, battle against inflation. It's about the Fed winning that battle, quite frankly, and slowing growth in a way which now is going to affect earnings. And that's going to be the story of the second half. So the first half was terrible for everything because you know, when financial conditions are tightening that rapidly, all risk assets trade off. Even commodities have had a tough go here lately. But in the second half of the year, we expect that, you know, bonds will be actually a safe haven because they do well when growth is slowing. And, of course, stocks will suffer. So we're just not done with this bear market. Um, you know, the good news is we've been in for probably over close to a year uh, for, for a lot of stocks. Uh, it's well advanced. But we, we just haven't had a concluding chapter yet. Mike, we've heard from some bulls out there on the equity market. I'm sure you've seen their research too. Marco Kalanovic at JP Morgan thinks that we can recover the first half losses in the second half in many places in this market. Jonathan Goldberg Credit Suisse is really constructive. He's looking for a double-digit return year-end. Take a listen to what he had to say. 
what we've seen so far this year, profits are up seven and a half percent year to date, and they'll probably be up another five to six percent between now and the end of, of the year. So we don't have a profit problem as much as people say. We think that the earnings continue to move forward, and we think that you get a bounce in valuation probably a couple of multiple points between now and the end of the year. Mike, I hear this a lot. You hear this a lot. What are they getting wrong? <laughs> well, look, I mean, I could be wrong. You know, who knows? But I mean, generally, I would say where we disagree is that we think that the profits are good right now, but it, the market cares about what profits are going to be. So, you know, we, we've had a pretty distinct view uh, for a while around this. And, you know, I think some of it's margin. Um, we think more of it's going to be more top line now because growth is going to disappoint and the risk of recession has gone up considerably. So I think to have confidence that, you know, the earnings growth that's being forecasted today will be achieved, um, I, I wouldn't have so much confidence in that. I mean, that's generally our, I think, our disagreement. I think earnings will disappoint over the next 12 months, maybe significantly if it's a recession, obviously. Um, and that's where the risk in the stock market lies. And, you know, the argument on valuation, you know, look, I mean, rates are still 288, even though they're down quite a bit here. You know, the equity risk premium, we think, is still underpriced for uh, a, you know, where we are in the growth cycle. And, and so you, you're not going to get relief on multiples. And if earnings come down, then it's a one for one. Lisa Shannon and Morgan Stanley, your colleague, earlier this week said the analysts at the moment are like deer in the headlights. They're just not cutting their estimates. When you look at the earnings estimates at the moment, Mike, is that true ex energy? What kind of picture do you get if you strip out energy? Yeah, that's a good question, John. We've looked at this, uh, we've published on it, which basically if you take energy and materials out, um, the forward end estimates have started to come down, but not significantly, not in a way like they should be. Um, I, I would say the companies are the ones in the headlights. I mean, you know, they, well, why are they not guiding lower? I mean, they should be seeing this um, you know, from a macro top-down standpoint. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it was obvious that six months ago what was going to happen to, to margins and pricing pressure. And, of course, then the inventory, which surprised everybody, which seems like that was pretty obvious, too, that we were going to get too much inventory, which then leads to discounting. So we're just very early days in the revision factors coming down. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't know who's in the headlights, but the bottom line is the earnings numbers are wrong. Mike, I'm surprised that the corporations are surprised, and I'm surprised that other people are surprised, that they're surprised. And I hope you manage to keep up there. Because, Mike, when the retailers come out and they offer us weak guidance, we don't just get small moves in the equity market as if we've priced this already. We get massive gaps lower. And I want to understand, Mike, what's going on there, just how well understood this is, how well priced this story is, and the pockets in the equity market where you think we haven't quite done enough work here, we haven't brought down expectations enough, and there's more price declines in our future. Well, John, that's what I always like about you. You always ask the right question, right? It was like, well, how could the stocks be surprised? I mean, because, you know, I think people uh, have been willing to get bullish too early in this in this down cycle saying, well, it's all priced. But then, as you mentioned, a couple of large retailers, you know, uh, came up with some surprisingly high inventory numbers and the stocks got absolutely smashed, meaning it wasn't in the stocks. So that's a wake-up call, right? I mean, it, what it means is that, you know, which you think that, you know, what might be in the price of the stock is probably not, and I would say I would say what's in the price of the stocks right now is a is a much tighter Fed, and the fact that they're fighting inflation and financial conditions are are going to remain tight. Okay, as you and I have discussed in the show before, I think the back end of the market, you know, is is kind of priced that in fully, and so multiples have priced in the Fed. What the market has not priced in is the earnings disappointment, whether that's because inventory is ballooned and there's discounting, or because you know top line demand just falls off because unit growth isn't there. Uh, it's a combination of both, and we're getting more conviction, not less conviction, that these numbers are going to have to come down by even more than we thought just six weeks ago. So, Mike, your number 3,400, that's now the base case. Can you walk me through the recessionary scenarios, too? Because the thing I keep hearing now, and we all hear a lot of it, is recession has slowly become the base case, but ultimately it's a shallow one. Is that your view, too? Yeah, we're not quite to the base case being recession, but it's probably 40% chance, so it's, you know, it's pretty darn close. And uh, we would, at this point, we would say we think it'll be a, a mild recession in the sense that it's not going to have, you know, big financial contagion, big default cycle, banking system is in good shape. So, you know, we can, we can actually come out of it uh, fairly good in a good situation next year. But to say that it's been priced already, we think is misplaced. Okay? And that's where we spent a lot of time in our research the last three or four weeks, because that's the question we're getting from clients is, okay, 
you know, we got to start thinking about a recession. Tell me where it's priced. And our analysis would strongly suggest that in a mild recessionary case, okay, not a, you know, stagflationary case, but a mild recessionary case, that you should probably trade close to 3,000 on the S&P 500. Now, timing of that is going to be challenging. Um, I would say probably fourth quarter is as good a guess as any if, if the recession becomes inevitable, okay? We don't know the answer to that. In the event that we don't have a recession and it's a softish landing where we can avoid the labor cycle, we think it's closer to 3,400, right? So you got to probability adjust that and you can then you know do your risk reward based on, on that downside risk. Now, in the middle of all that, John, of course, there's going to be individual stock opportunities and things to do, which is our job as you know, strategists and investors is to, you know, everything doesn't bottom on the same day. And so, you know, our, our objective is to try and, and time this at the stock level as well as at the index level. Well, Mike, can we talk about that? And we'll finish there too. You started this year and we get to talk a lot and I'm grateful for that by de-emphasizing the index level story and emphasizing some single names. Can you re-emphasize those single names right now, Mike, and the pockets of risk you're willing to take, even with the risk that you've explained around the earnings story through the rest of this year? Yeah, so we, we've been uh, positioned defensively and then, you know, uh, with a barbell with uh, energy because those are your classic late cycle groups, okay? So that's been working really well this year. Things like healthcare, things like REITs and utilities, even some of the staples up until recently have held up, but of course now they're feeling inflationary pressure. So those, those types of stocks have been working well with energy. And then the other thing we've been really uh, looking at are companies that have high operational efficiency, meaning they can deliver you know, profits growth or profits and margin in a difficult operating environment. Okay, now here's where it gets interesting to us. All right, if it's, a, if it's an extension of the cycle, a soft landing, we're gonna probably rotate back into things like technology, uh, industrials, probably even on more energy, maybe go back to materials again. However, in the recessionary outcome, you can't do that. You need to stay defensive all the way till the end, and then we'll flip it probably sometime later this year into what we call early cycle groups, things like banks, you know, semiconductors, uh, retailers, consumer cyclicals. We just think it's way premature to be making that trade now, right? Because you haven't priced the recession yet. That means those early cycle groups, it's just not time. And I think you'll remember back in, you know, March of 2020, when we made that flip, you know, we, we timed it well, fortunately, in that instance, um, you know, people thought we were nuts, but that's exactly what you have to do in that recessionary outcome. All I can tell you, John, is that everything's happening faster this cycle yeah. than I've ever seen. It's going to, the conclusion to this chapter, okay, it's going to be either a recession or an extension of this expansion. It's going to be fast. And it's going to be, oh, we're going to know the answer probably by October. Mike. I think I've told you this before. I thought you were nuts too, but you turned out to be very <laughs> right. Mike Wilson, thank you. And Morgan Stanley, Mike, we appreciate it. Enjoy the long weekend, sir. We're positive just about on the S&P by a tenth of 1%, negative just about on the NASDAQ by a tenth of 1%. Coming up, President Biden looking for a helping hand with gasoline prices. All the Gulf states are meeting. I indicated to them that I thought they should be increasing oil production generically, not to the Saudis. The team coverage from Madrid, Spain, following the NATO meeting up next. enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. of the year, but Bali is still quiet and empty. I am here in Kuta Legian, one of the main walking streets here that is used to be a tourist spot for beach, dining, shopping, 
but many shops here are still closed. Most of the outlets are either for rent or for sale as they have run out of business. Saya kerjanya di sini udah lama, udah ada 10 tahunan di sini kerja. Masih sepi sih, enggak kayak dulu. Kalau dulu kan rame. Sekarang ya ada satu dua itu ada. Tapi enggak kayak dulu. Kalau dulu rame sekali. Sekarang paling dapat jualan ya 100, 120 gitu. 100, 200 ya. Kalau dulu sih ya nyampe ada 1 juta, 1 setengah itu nyampe dapat jualan. Bisa sampai 2 juta dulu. Sekarang enggak, enggak pernah lagi dapat segitu. Sama aja. Belum ada turis ke Bali. Masih ya domestik aja. While Bali has reopened its borders for foreign tourists since October, they are still not coming in. Many international airlines are yet to reinstate their direct flight to the island. Balinese people here really hope they can see more people from Australia, China, and Europe to come visit next year. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. as sort of 4,000 would be a level, sort of a ceiling over the next several months. It would be difficult for equity prices to kind of pierce that level on the upside. Uh, and that would be the idea if the, that was to be happening. The Fed might have to be leaning harder into, uh, into forward guidance and things like that. The idea of looking out towards the end of the year, the sort of baseline scenario would be if the Fed has and inflation starts to recede in the fall, that would allow equity prices perhaps to move higher. Alternative scenario would be recession, and in a recessionary environment in a scenario, you're probably looking at a level of the market around 3,150, uh, and the sort of transmission mechanism for how that happens would be a series of significant negative earnings revisions across the market, kind of looking into 2023, and that would take a consensus number right now around $250 for next year in profits. That would probably take that down closer to 200 uh, and then that transmission mechanism as it sort of degrades, we talked about in the, in the previous session, uh, that would probably lead to a multiple that goes a little bit lower. The idea of the equity market having derated from 21 times earnings to around 16 times or so now, 16 times forward earnings, that's been a total driver, the significant driver, higher rates, lower equity prices. We just haven't seen it on the earnings front. Goldman's David Costin, just awesome yesterday, talking about the potential for a cap on any potential rally right now on the equity market of about 4K at the moment, 3,800. Contributing to this morning's gains, a rally in energy as well, the commodity and the equity. The president, for him, that's the elephant in the room, looking for the Gulf states to help tamp down surging prices. All the Gulf states are meeting. I indicated to them that I thought they should be increasing oil production generically, not to the, to the Saudis particularly. And I think we're going to, I hope we see them in their own interest concluding that makes sense to do. Let's get to the team, the Bloomberg team, Anna Madrid, Spain, Anne Marie, and Maria Tadeo. Maria and Anne Marie, fantastic work this week. Let's just put some concluding remarks on it. Maria, how much was the energy story the elephant in the room, whether it was Bavaria, Germany, or Madrid, Spain? It was the entire elephant in the room. I think it really, it really, that is the thing. When you look at what to me is a highlight of this very intense diplomatic week is Emmanuel Macron who goes running after President Biden knowing full well there's a camera in front of him and he tells him, hey, I spoke to the Saudis, like, perhaps you told me I should do, and they said it's full maximum capacity, so what can we do now? They're not going to do more. I think that that, to me, was a real takeaway. You don't say something like that if you don't want the cameras and send a political message uh, there. He also did the same to the Indians, by the way. He said, what about the cap? Would you agree with that? Of course, it didn't go anywhere, but it really shaped uh, the conversation, and I guess that was a real takeaway from it. They really want to turn off the revenue machine for Vladimir Putin. This is a 
reason why the war is still ongoing in their view because it's able to pay for this war machine, but they don't find the way to turn down their revenue. And it's been an incredible year for energy if you're the Russians right now. So it is a tricky, very tricky question. And Marie, your thoughts? Well, yesterday, really, when the president was asked from our colleague about, are you going, and this is going to be, everyone is going to be watching this meeting, right? When he steps off in Jeddah, how is his interaction going to be with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? And he, the president tried to cage this trip, saying he's going to meet the GCC, all the Gulf partners. He's going to ask all the Gulf partners. But Jonathan, you and I know not all the Gulf partners can help the president with $5 gasoline. There's two that have the spare capacity, and that's the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And even if the president goes, and he will be going, and even if the Saudis acquiesce and they pump more, that will not solve $5 gasoline in America. But the issue for the president is, while the Saudis cannot fix the market alone, you cannot fix the oil market without the kingdom. To the two of you, Saudi fantastic yes. work this week. Just absolutely brilliant to both of you. Amory Hordern to Maria Tadeo as they go from Bavaria, Germany to Madrid, Spain, wrapping up the NATO summit and, of course, the G7 meeting earlier this week as well. From New York, your trading diary, up next. Crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. Equity is just about positive. That's a turnaround. We're positive a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields lower, much lower. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. Here is the number one data point of the week for me. ISM manufacturing at the top of the hour. President Biden meeting with U.S. governors at 1 Eastern next week. U.S. markets closing for Independence Day on Monday. The FOMC minutes on Wednesday. And finally, the main event on Friday, the payrolls report. Guy Johnson's going to pick it up in about four minutes and give you that ISM manufacturing number. Mike McKee will break that down. Kriti Gupta is going to give you an idea of just how bad travel is going to be this long weekend. From New York City, from me to you, try and enjoy your long weekend stateside. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.
think space, you probably think one space agency that travels under the radar is ESA. Which is surprising considering what the European Space Agency has achieved and how vital it is to the global space industry. We've collaborated with pretty much everybody who is involved in space exploration. But ESA wants to be a leading force in furthering humanity's mission into space. Commander Crown, do you copy? Copy. If we want to have successful human missions to Mars, we are going to have to learn to live and work off-world in a different way. The place where we are going to learn to do that is on the moon. Can ESA help humanity take its next giant leap? A lot's happening on Wall Street. It's the basic law of economics. It validated what the market was already pricing. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. David, you just hit the nail right on the head. From businesses most influential and instrumental. And that's the way you run good risk management. It's a challenging dynamic. We could continue to see that kind of strength. Bloomberg Wall Street Week premieres Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Pepsi's number fever campaign in the Philippines has probably gone down in history as one of the biggest marketing disasters in history, mainly because of a human error that led Pepsi to print more winning caps than they planned. The resulting chaos caused riots, civil unrest, and even deaths. Reporting this story took over a year and it resulted in me flying uh, to Manila in the Philippines to meet unlucky winners and to find out exactly what happened back then in the 1990s. My name is Jeff Maish. I'm a journalist based in Los Angeles. I wrote the story for Bloomberg Business Week about Pepsi's number fever campaign. The Philippines is a really interesting country. It's made up of thousands of islands. And it's also a country that's very heavily influenced by America. American culture is everywhere you look in the Philippines. They're obsessed with Frank Sinatra music, for example. They love all things America, and that extends to their, their love for soft drinks, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola. In the 1990s, it was everywhere. Pepsi and Coca-Cola were embroiled in what is now known as the Cola Wars. It was a fierce battle for market dominance. Number Fever was already a really popular promotion. It had been rolled out in America to great success. And so Pepsi decided to roll it out internationally, particularly in Asia. They thought it was the answer to their problems. They thought it could finally help them beat their biggest competitor. A million pesos, or $68,000, doesn't sound like a lot now, but in 1992, that was a phenomenal amount of money. You've got to remember that in the Philippines at the time, the average monthly income was about $100, so a million pesos was wealth beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. Number Fever caught fire in the Philippines. Kids were saving up their pocket money to buy a bottle of Pepsi. Parents were squirreling away all of the bottle caps in bags. You would walk down the street and people were going through trash trying to find discarded bottle caps. It was a national phenomenon. Pepsi boasted that half the population of the Philippines was playing it. Number Fever boosted Pepsi's sales 
every month from $10 million to $14 million. It had a huge impact on Pepsi's bottom line. Number fever quickly became number hysteria. Maids were being jailed for stealing their employers winning bottle caps. There was even some murders uh, over, over winning bottle caps. People were fighting in the streets uh, over these caps. There were signs that there were going to be problems with number fever very early. Pepsi had rolled out the competition in Chile and a garbled fax had caused some kind of problem with the winning number. They'd announced the wrong one in Chile, causing riots. There were signs that there could be big problems ahead if they didn't keep their eye on the ball. So in 1992, Pepsi decided to extend the campaign in the Philippines, and they announced that the competition would go on for a few more weeks. One night, on the television news, they announced the latest winning number, 349. The problem was, 349 had already been allocated as a non-winning number in earlier campaigns. So there were literally hundreds of thousands of bottle caps with 349 just floating around the Philippines. Hundreds of thousands of people all across the Philippines, thousands of islands, were finding winning bottle caps. 349, 349. Some people had 10 lucky 349 bottle caps. People were dancing in the street, celebrating. They thought their problems were over. They were millionaires. It's still not certain exactly how many winners there were of lucky 349 bottle caps, but we know that Pepsi printed over 600,000 of them. Pepsi realized very early that there was a problem. Hundreds of people started arriving at their bottling plants with their lucky bottle caps. They realized something was seriously wrong. Pepsi tried to solve the problem by offering a small token donation to anyone that brought a lucky bottle cap to their bottling plant. But it wasn't enough. People didn't want just a handful of pesos. People wanted their million peso prize. Within a year, violent protests and riots outside Pepsi factories would leave dozens injured and five people dead. At one Pepsi factory in the Philippines, a grenade was thrown through the window. It killed three Pepsi employees. Anacita Rosario was a school teacher living near Manila in the Philippines. She was one of the tragic victims of this whole thing. She was walking to a nearby store to buy some rice one day when a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a Pepsi truck in a, in a violent protest. It bounced under the truck and exploded. It killed her and an innocent bystander who was just a child and injured many others. When I was in the Philippines, I tracked down Anasita's daughter, Cindy, and her husband, Raul. It was clear to me that they were still very upset by the whole thing. You know, a family had been ripped apart by this competition. And Raul told me that he'd never remarried. He'd uh, told me that he'd gone to meet Pepsi executives after his wife was killed. And he was angry. He, he said to them, you know, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for number fever. The biggest revelation from my reporting was rumors that Pepsi was somehow involved in bombing their own trucks. I found a newspaper report with a headline that said, Pepsi goons bomb their own trucks. And when I visited the MBI, the police uh, department in, in the Philippines, they presented me with documents and interviews with people who claimed that Pepsi had paid them to cause riots and to cause trouble outside their plants in order to destabilize the situation and to frame the owners of the coalitions uh, that, were, that were fighting them to try and curry favor. I just thought that was, that was so shocking. And of course, Pepsi denied it, but how bizarre that a company would be accused of bombing their own trucks. The contest had sparked so much anger in the Philippines because it landed at just this really weird time in 
the Philippines' history. It was during a crazy election that was racked with allegations of fraud. The Philippines was in a kind of love-hate relationship with America. They loved, obviously, the American aid and finances that was pouring into the country, but at the same time, they yearned for independence. They wanted to be their own country. Vicente Del Fierro was a local preacher living in Manila, and he hated the number fever campaign. Del Fierro thought Pepsi's number fever campaign was just one of the many ways that America was asserting its dominance over a third world country. He hated seeing his fellow countrymen get ripped off in his eyes by this huge multinational American company. He wanted justice. Del Fierro rounded up over 800 winners of 349 bottle caps, and he got them all together to sue Pepsi for over $400 million to be divided between those holders of lucky bottle caps. Del Fierro took money from some of the people who could afford it. They paid him 500 pesos to help with legal fees. But for people who couldn't afford the, the money, he would just represent them pro bono. The alliance is to build up pressure on Pepsi and so you see people uh, marching in the streets. Mm -hmm. So um, we had mounted our own uh, campaign even in the US. Even in the US. He flew to America and he hired two uh, consumer lawyers uh, here in America to take on Pepsi. He had a meeting at Pepsi's headquarters to try and resolve the problem. But he said he wanted to take it all the way to the highest courts in America. When those cases were heard in America, those courts decided that this was a problem that should be heard in the Philippines, not in America. Back in the Philippines, Del Fierro continued his case in the Filipino courts. At one stage, there were arrest warrants handed out for nine Pepsi-Cola executives, which he saw as a big victory. We don't know if those arrest warrants were ever upheld, but it made newspaper headlines across the country. Pepsi did not take kindly to Del Fierro's campaign. They tried everything to shut him down. They sued him for libel. My father had to attend three times a month for a branch 145, and another hearing for the branch 138, also three times a month. Also, um, there was a time uh, my father was hospital due to heart failure. Still, he had to attend the two branch hearing otherwise. Uh, for not attending, the judge will issue a warrant of arrest to my father. Uh, my father uh, passed away January 13, 2010, after staying for almost one year in a hospital. He died of complication due to heart failure. After the death of my father, I was inspired to do the website. PepsiCo will be remembered for what they did to the consumer in the Philippines and to my father. When I reached out to Pepsi for comment for this story, they claimed that they didn't have access to anyone who was working at Pepsi that was around in those days. They also said that during COVID-19, they didn't have access to their, their documents about this, but you know, they were, very, they were very careful to say that they were sorry for everything that happened. And we do know that Pepsi did try everything to try and make this right. The Pepsi number fever disaster cost the company millions. We know that they paid up to $10 million in those goodwill payments. But the financial effect could be much greater. After the disaster, we know that Pepsi sales dipped. They were overtaken by Coca-Cola again. Pepsi's number fever disaster changed the legacy of that soft drink in the Philippines forever. Some people of a certain age won't touch it. For many people, Pepsi is a taboo word. A lot of the people that I spoke to were still quite traumatized by their experience, by that experience of winning a million pesos, losing it, and then returning to their normal life in poverty in Manila.
When the news of the bombing came out, it was a massive story in Germany. We are following some breaking news coming to us out of Dortmund in Germany. It was covered by all the media outlets. Three roadside explosions triggered at the same time last night as the coach left its hotel in the south of Dortmund. Public figures commented on it. We should not let them affect our, our life, whoever it was. The media echo went far beyond Dortmund. I think it was front page news in every single big paper around Europe. Everyone thought of like a terrorist attack and people were scared that throughout the city in Dortmund there was more attacks to be happening. Unbeknownst to investigators, just after the bomb went off and the, the players of the team were shell-shocked, the person who had masterminded the attack was actually sitting in the hotel eating uh, steak and sweet potatoes. My name is Thomas Rogers. I'm the journalist who wrote the article, The Get Rich Quick Scheme That Nearly Killed a German Soccer Team. Dortmund is a mid-sized city in the western part of Germany in a state called North Rhine-Westphalia. And it's a former industrial city that's kind of fallen on hard times in the last few decades. It was severely bombed in the war. So the center of the city is quite stark. Some of the few high points include its soccer team. My name is Ike Henning. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News, and I'm a great fan of Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund fans are super loyal. On all match days, the entire city is in black and yellow. It's like a religion. I think more than most German cities, uh, Soccer does play a very large role in the identity of Dortmund. In October of 2000, the uh, BBB became the first team in the Bundesliga to actually go public. Salaries for uh, soccer players in the Bundesliga have gone up very dramatically. With such high prices, they thought that by, um, by going public, they would be able to compete better with big teams like Bayern Munich. Unfortunately, that didn't go too well. Dortmund bought too many expensive players, high wages, and the club almost went bust in 2005. The, the price of their shares, uh, it has sometimes gone up, but mostly gone down since they made that decision. So on April 11th, 2017, the team was staying in a hotel on the outskirts of Dortmund. Match days are always special in Dortmund. Everyone is looking forward to it. The team always meets in the same hotel ahead of matches. They stayed in this hotel in order to have a kind of neutral space before games so that they could concentrate, be sort of isolated from distractions, things like that. Everyone was pretty optimistic. They had a chance to go really far, maybe into the finals. I was in the office and getting ready for match day. I was going to meet with a friend, a fellow Dortmund supporter in a pub. As always, the fans are very excited about matches. On that day, they were heading to play in the quarterfinal against AS Monaco at Signal Iduna Stadium, which is in the center of Dortmund. Shortly before 7 p.m., the players of the team boarded their official team bus. When the bus took off the parking lot of the hotel and turned on the street, there were three, three detonations, three bombs that exploded and hit the bus of Dortmund. Three explosions occurred close to the Borussia Dortmund team bus. The B team bus had just left the hotel. The explosions destroyed two windows in the rear part of the bus. People screamed, people jumped to the ground. The fellow Dortmund fan I was supposed to watch the match with, uh, he called me and said, turn on, turn on the TV, there was an attack on the Dortmund bus, and I thought he was like, that was impossible. Some of the players uh, screamed at the driver to keep driving as fast as possible because they were worried that people might storm the bus. German investigators say the explosive devices used in the attack on the Borussia Dortmund bus contained metal pins and that one had pierced a seat headrest. Unbeknownst to the team members, the actual mastermind behind the attack was as they were disembarking the bus was actually eating steak and sweet potatoes at the hotel they had just left. Authorities are attempting to verify a letter left at the scene claiming jihadists were behind the attack. 
because there had been a series of attacks by Islamic terrorists in Germany and Europe, there was a widespread suspicion in the media that this was another Islamic uh, terror attack. Three letters were found at the site of the bombing that took credit uh, for the attack on behalf of Islamic State. There were, however, reasons to, to, to doubt this particular narrative. It would actually be a surprise um, if ISIS um, were actually um, part of this, this attack. It possibly could be um, a ploy by other groups like the far right wing to try and shift the blame. The letters had some strange qualities. They were written in a strange uh, German that used big, sophisticated words, um, but had basic grammar mistakes, as if someone was a native German speaker but pretending to be a foreign person. Federal investigators have detained one man, suspected of links to Islamist terrorism, one of two suspects whose apartments were raided this morning. Shortly after the, the bombing, uh, a, a man in Austria named Rudolf, who is a, was a big uh, BBB fan, he noticed that something strange was going on on the stock market related to the team's shares. He emailed the lawyers of BBB, who then forwarded that email on to investigators. The email stated that someone had bought 60,000 uh, BBB put options, a wager that the value of the shares of the team would fall below a certain amount at a certain day. Why would someone buy that ahead of a match and then three bombs go off, uh, something, something, something isn't right here. For the person to make money off of that, it required the stock to go down quite a bit in a fairly short period of time. And it wouldn't just be the team losing a match, it would require something much bigger than that. There was another big red flag about this purchase, which is the fact that it had actually been made, number one, on the day of the bombing, but also um, from an IP address that had been traced to the actual hotel where the bombing had taken place. When three explosions targeted the bus carrying the Borussia Dortmund footballers on April the 11th, written notes left at the scene claimed the attack was the work of ISIL. The truth, as is now alleged, is remarkable. On April 21st, the police arrested a man uh, in a southern German city called Tübingen. He was on his way to work, and his name was Sergei Benagold. He seemed like an unlikely suspect uh, because he had no known connections to the uh, Islamic uh, terror world. He didn't seem like a far-right extremist. He didn't seem like a left-wing extremist either. He seemed to be a completely unremarkable young man. A 28-year-old German-Russian man named only as Sergei W. stayed in the same hotel as the players on the night before the bombing. He specifically requested an upper room overlooking the bushes where the explosive devices were hidden. The media dissected why he would do that, what was his past. He had uh, been inspired by the 2015 terror attack in Paris. And he noticed that in the aftermath of the attack, the stocks of French companies went down. And he believed that if an attack uh, took place that was directed at a specific company, that the decrease in stock price would, for that company would be even more dramatic. It never occurred to anyone that someone would do that out of greed. We now know that the suspect bought three different derivatives on the Borsia Dortmund shares. With all these derivatives, he bet on falling shares. The suspect bought the majority of these financial products on the 11th of April, the day of the attack. If the plot had been completely successful uh, and the stock had reached a value of zero, Bainergold would have made up to 570,000 euros, uh, or the equivalent of uh, about $608,000. Ultimately, the plan completely backfired. The attacker, Sergei Bainergold, didn't make any money. In fact, he lost money. In court, he would be extremely quiet. He usually kept his hands clasped together. One of the lawyers actually commented that he had never seen a defendant act so calmly. Wiener Gold had served some time in the German military. From that information and from online research, he was able to figure out how to assemble remote detonated bombs that would do um, what he hoped to do. 
There were a few days of extremely emotional testimony, including the soccer players who described doubting whether or not they could ever play another game again. It brought everything back up and it didn't quite help them to kind of process what was going on. Throughout it all, he sat there completely silent. The big mystery that was swirling around the trial was the question of why he may have simply done it because he wanted to impress a woman. Rebecca is a young woman who has a very troubled home life. She ultimately sees her relationship with Vaynergold as an opportunity to leave that troubled home. Vaynergold is a Russian immigrant to Germany. He speaks with an accent. He has anxiety in large groups of Germans. She begins to resent the fact that he has these fears and feels a little bit trapped. Rebecca attempts to dump him on multiple occasions, and he threatens to commit suicide if she leaves him. Vaynergold apparently uh, told Rebecca that she would soon be seeing a surprise. After being dumped uh, via text message, uh, he apparently began planning for this attack in earnest. Vaynergold was charged with 28 counts of attempted murder, which carried a maximum sentence in Germany of life in prison. He claimed that he had nothing to do with the attack, but as time went on, he admitted that he had actually been the person who had built the explosives and had set them off. Uh, but he claimed that he didn't want to actually kill anybody. Ultimately, Vayner Gold didn't receive the harshest possible sentence. Uh, he was given 14 years in prison, but it's still a considerable amount in, in jail in Germany. The threat of an asteroid hitting Earth is very real. If it's big enough, it's also very final. These are very, very infrequent events. The probability is not zero, though. A blinding flash of light streaking across the sky. About 100 tons of space rock falls on Earth every day. Most of it is so small, it burns up in our atmosphere or lands unnoticed away from major populations. No human in the past thousand years is known to have been killed by a meteorite. And according to NASA, no large object is likely to strike the Earth any time in the next several hundred years. However, one thing is certain. We haven't found them all. There are thousands out there, and we don't know where they are. asteroids in our solar system. They number in the billions. Scientists all over the world are working toward detecting and deflecting the most catastrophic of natural disasters. The race is on to find as many of these objects as we can. We have a way of calculating whether or not an asteroid is potentially dangerous or not. I mean, I think it's something worth investing in. <laughs> it's our existence at stake, right? Amy, let's get this one out of the way. It's probably the question you get asked the most, but how scared should we be? Asteroids and comets are a natural hazard that's out there like a lot of other natural hazards. Uh, these are very, very infrequent events, these collision events where, where an object actually impacts the Earth. The most important thing that we need to know about asteroids is you know, when the next impact is going to happen and how bad it will be. What we know is that an object that's about say, a kilometer across, is capable of causing very, very wide devastation across the planet, really, truly global devastation. 
The object that wiped out the dinosaurs was somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 kilometers across, so even bigger than that. At a kilometer, it's still gonna be very uh, bad and it will have global effects. For objects that are capable of causing what I would call sort of regional damage, kind of a large major metropolitan area, a city and its surrounding environments, sort of around 100-ish meters. It depends on the details of the composition and so forth. By the 1980s, NASA was cataloging near-Earth objects. In 1994, stargazers watched as comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter. The resulting zone of chaos was estimated to be as large as the Earth, and the event became a turning point in the search for asteroids and comets in our solar system. In 1998, Congress tasked NASA with finding 90% of asteroids and comets one kilometer wide or larger. Soon after, Hollywood blockbusters Armageddon and Deep Impact brought attention and fear to the masses. The great news is that the vast majority, more than 90% of all the really large one kilometer near Earth objects have been found. The challenge now is working down to these smaller sizes that are still quite capable of causing a lot of damage, uh, but they're just harder to spot because they're fainter, they're smaller. Can you give us a sense of how many are out there in our solar system? We know that there are a lot of asteroids in our solar system. They number in the billions. Most of them, however, are between uh, Mars and Jupiter in what we call the main asteroid belt. This is a region of space where most of the asteroids in the inner part of our, our solar system live, and they stay there for many billions of years. There is another population, though, that kind of leaks inward and gets into the region somewhat close to the Earth, and we call these near-Earth objects. We think that there are millions and millions of near-Earth objects that are out there in the total population. As of today, we know of sort of around 20, 25,000, something like that. When we first spot an object, we, we really know very little about it. We just see something moving across the sky. So all you get is just sort of a handful of snapshots, just enough to be able to tell that this isn't an asteroid that we've already seen before. And then once we can calculate the distance to it, we can now start to make predictions about its true size. Is it large or is it small? So we have a lot of information that we have to get pretty quickly to really understand what's going on. Finding asteroids is just one piece of the puzzle. Planetary scientists are extremely skilled in determining the orbits and speeds of asteroids based on relatively small amounts of data. NASA runs simulations of the trajectories asteroids could take, which is useful but time consuming. A team of scientists in the Netherlands have found a way that could buy us more time. Our method is very quick. So you can very quickly get an assessment of whether or not the object is dangerous or not. If you look at the classical way of determining the danger of an asteroid, it may take you know, days of computing time on very big machines to, uh, to determine this, this uh, hazardousness. The current problem is that there's just too many asteroids out there to uh, spend a huge amount of uh, computational power on all of them. So the neural network allows us to focus on what really could go and uh, pose a hazard to Earth. A neural network is a computing system that mimics the way the human brain operates to find underlying relationships in a set of data. By training the network in this way, you, you train it in recognizing those objects that are most likely to hit the planet. And once it's trained, you can apply this network to all the unknown asteroids. And then you can make a selection and saying, hey, this is, these are the ones which appear to be having orbits similar to the ones which we know are hitting the planet. That doesn't mean that they do, but it, does, it only means that they look very similar to the ones we, we know they do. What else did you find? Should we be particularly concerned about anything? One thing that we did find is that um, our neural network was able to go and um, identify a handful of asteroids which weren't considered potentially hazardous, that uh, when we went and integrated them forward in time, they came uh, quite close to Earth. We find a handful which were not detected before or not considered being dangerous before, and we think they are potentially dangerous. It's very hard to simulate kind of going forward in time an asteroid that's going to hit Earth because, well, the Earth is really small and, uh, well, space is really big, and then you have to have very exact parameters to shoot an asteroid that goes and hits exactly Earth. 
And then Simon had the ingenious idea of not even trying to do that and just launching the asteroids from Earth's surface and integrating backwards in time. It's very hard to make it hit. So you need a lot of, a lot of calculations which all end up in nothing. And the idea was then like, well, let's not do that. This is basically what NASA is doing. NASA is taking an asteroid, making multiple copies of them, shooting them all forwards in time, calculating their orbits, and then see what fraction sort of gets close to Earth. Not even hitting Earth, but getting close to Earth. And then they call it a potential impactor. So you calculate the solar system forwards in time for let's say a thousand years. And then you launch asteroids from the surface as if they, if you go forwards in time would fall on the surface. You calculate them backwards to today, and then you get your orbital parameters of today's asteroids, which you know will land on the planet. And those you can use as known impactors and compare with all the other asteroids in the, in the solar system. Can simulations and, and AI, can those things fill in the gaps where perhaps telescopes and, and other imaging tools can't? Absolutely. Since the observations get more complex, uh, the physics gets more complex. And if the physics get more complex, the mathematics becomes more complex. And at some point, you can't solve your problems analytically anymore. And then this is where the computer comes in. Now we have this trained neural network. We have a way of calculating in a fraction of a second whether or not an asteroid is potentially dangerous or not and therefore deserves more attention or, or more time to spend on uh, for, for really finding out if it is dangerous. When it comes to hunting asteroids, time is critical. What we can do about a potentially hazardous object depends a great deal on what we know about it and how much time we have before the encounter. We'd really like to find them when they're decades away. Because the more time you have, the more options you have. And the less energy it takes to, to move an object aside. It also means we might not have to resort to launching a nuclear warhead at an asteroid until recently, pretty much our only choice. That's an option of last resort, in my opinion, yes. We have lots of options available. You can just simply bump into the object and just nudge it out of the way. That's one possibility, and that's kind of, in a way, sort of the simplest thing to think about, just nudging it off its path a little bit with, you know, a massive object, a spacecraft, let's say. It's just kind of like bowling, if you will. You know, if you have a long time or a long stretch of, of runway in the lane, just a very small twist on the on the bowling ball will make a big change in where it ultimately ends up. Another option it would be something where you take a very big, big, massive spacecraft and you park it next to the object and you use the force of gravity as a towing rig. That takes longer, though, and you need to be able to send a pretty massive spacecraft, and it obviously depends a lot on how big the asteroid is. Other options start to get more and more complicated, and uh, they range from painting one side of the object a white color and painting the other side dark and then letting the pressure of light sort of perturb its orbit. In a departure from the lab and computer simulations, NASA has real plans to rehearse kinetic impact deflection. In 2021, the agency will launch DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test Mission, which will intercept a 160-meter asteroid in 2022 better to practice now before we have to deal with an actual threat. In the meantime, discovering asteroids is our best bet. Thousands of scientists and amateur astronomers around the world make up an informal network that survey the heavens. But that may not be enough. NASA wants more resources to map our solar system and better technology. We need to ramp up our network of sensors. And also, uh, we need to just continue to strengthen our, our network of international observers so that we can get follow-up, uh, because we find these objects when they're distributed all over the night sky. Once we get more observations, we get better data, we can make better predictions. If you look at the big impactors we have had in the last, let's say, 20 years, or maybe 30 years, or 50 years, most of them we haven't seen coming. So the danger, the real danger, I think, comes from the objects we don't know about and not from the objects we do know about. This particular natural disaster, like a lot of natural disasters and like climate change, is a problem of the global commons. Uh, so the thing that we risk collectively is that it sort of then becomes nobody's problem and nobody takes ownership over it. The asteroids are all over the sky. They just truly cross boundaries and borders with a second's notice kind of imagine in the future maybe lots of small satellites around the earth that are always going and looking outward. I mean, I think it's something worth investing in. <laughs> it's our existence at stake. Right?
right? The pandemic has affected everyone in different ways. Some pass the time by baking. Homemade sourdough bread. Do I need to say more? Some chose to binge watch Netflix. It's your game. Or maybe you started a garden oasis in your backyard. Next, I'm going to put my lettuces in. But for millions of others... I'm going to be posting stocks that will... They wanted to uproot the financial industry. Let's just lock it on up and take $15,000. Here's a stock that can change your life. I see a stock going up and I buy it and I just watch it until it stops going up and then I sell it. I have gained over $3 million. I want some free money. I don't think you can overstate the online communities or social media's influence on financial markets. A large group of inexperienced investors who discuss their plans on social media platform Reddit have shaken up the stock market in a big way. The stock that everybody's talking about right now is GameStop. Video game retailer GameStop is set to continue their head-spinning ascent today. The revolutionaries on Reddit are spanking Wall Street's ass. The more these stocks go up, the more the big guys are getting creamed and losing billions of dollars. This isn't a wealthy person's game anymore. Anyone can play it. I took up a little bit of a new hobby, and I'm interested in day trading. As an investor nowadays, you don't have to look a specific way. You don't have to wear specific clothes. You don't have to be doing it from a trading place or on Wall Street in like a high-rise building in, in, in downtown Manhattan. The narrative of what's driving the markets is no longer being held in secret offices in New York and Boston of privileged people talking to other privileged people. It's right out in the open. It's on Twitter. It's on Reddit. From brokerage apps to Discord channels and subreddits to TikTok finfluencers, one of the last holdouts in the world of disruption, finance, is next in line. Investing should be as ubiquitous as shopping online. That's Vlad Tenev, the CEO of Robinhood, the online brokerage app, talking about how he wants his app to disrupt the world of stock trading like Amazon disrupted the world of home shopping. And I think that speaks to exactly the mission that a platform like Robinhood has, which is to democratize investing. Robinhood was started in 2013 by Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bhatt in, where else, Silicon Valley, as an alternative to the big brokerages, but with one big difference. As they were building the social network around finances for people, they realized that there was a gap in the market and that free trading uh, could become something that they could uh, bring to the markets, they could disrupt the industry. While no fee trading is industry standard today, it was unheard of when it was first introduced. The online brokerage industry was really innovative when they came on the scene 10, 15 years ago, but they kind of stopped innovating where you haven't seen those commissions come down beyond five or six or seven dollars. Robinhood think that by offering zero commission that they're gonna push people onto this platform. And on top of no fee trading, the customers Robinhood was courting have been long overlooked in the world of finance. So the typical customer of a Charles Schwab, for example, is putting a lot more money in that brokerage account than the typical customer at Robinhood. Even today, with all of its popularity, the median account size is about $240. 
the Fidelities and the Schwabs and the E-Trades of the world, they look down their nose at those kind of accounts. I, I don't want a $1,000 account. They're just a headache. I want a $100,000 account. And this is key here, right? Because the thing about Robinhood that's different than every other single brokerage platform is how easy it is to use. The design of the Robinhood app really has in mind a user who might be coming at this absolutely cold. The fonts are very well sized, the shapes, the colors, all of that is something that the founders of Robinhood paid really close attention to. And by creating an interface that catered to a newer investor, they were able to gather a pretty healthy group of customers. And by 2019, they had about 10 million customers. Those 10 million customers were a huge success story for Robinhood, but no one could have predicted its explosion after the arrival of COVID-19. Remain indoors to the greatest extent and 100% of the non-essential workforce must stay home. What we saw when the pandemic hit was the growth of Robinhood users absolutely turbocharged. And oddly, you saw this surge in interest in stock trading. Then they saw the absolute surge in 2020 in customer growth. And now, by many accounts, they have more than 20 million customers, which is pretty extraordinary. So the next step for them is to figure out how to monetize those users and how, even with their small account sizes, to get them to grow with the company and, as it releases more products, come along with them. Robinhood would become one of the COVID economy's breakout successes. Robinhood traders, as they're called, became the shorthand explanation for the frenzy of often speculative retail investing after the pandemic lockdowns. Kids wake up in the morning, they go on Robinhood. They're, you know, in the shower, they check Robinhood. Kids are learning how the stock market works at 18 while they're at school, you know, checking their phones in between classes because notifications pop up telling them what their stocks are doing that day. With these new tools, millennials and Gen Z are investing in the market in ways their parents could have never even dreamt of. That is sort of key when we talk about the divide between older and younger generations is that the younger generation was exposed to so much more information and tools at their disposal to do what they want in the market. The older generations, you never had the technology or the cost structure that you could play the markets like you can today. So you were stuck with giving your money to a professional investor and paying them a fee to do it. When I speak to young kids, they tell me, I'm making mistakes, I'm losing money. I'm not a perfect investor, but I'm 18. And by the time I'm 30, which will be, you know, 10 years from now, I'm gonna have interacted with the markets for a decade. And so it's a learning experience more so than anything else. And you can look at it and you can say, wow, that's, you know, that's risk taking, that's dumb. But, you know, if you could possibly shave 10, 20 years off your working life versus adding five years, I don't think you can fault people for that. But Robinhood is only part of the puzzle. Sure, you can trade on it, but without research, information, and data, you're just blindly throwing darts at different stocks and hoping to strike it rich. Wall Street forever has always run on what we now call narratives or memes. You know, people telling rumors to each other have been around for a hundred years. On Wall Street, information is its own currency. Historically, either you had it or you didn't. 
and the people who had it had a huge advantage. In the past, those narratives and memes didn't have a network effect. It would be one person telling another person over the phone. In fact, when I broke into this business in the 80s, a lot of people used to complain that they weren't on the call list to get those ideas. Social media changed all of that. Fast forward to 2021, that's being done on the internet now. And that's being done on Discord and Twitter and stock twits and Reddit. And the impact is very similar, but orders and orders of magnitude larger. As social media has played a bigger part in our lives, it's also played a bigger and kind of more important role in how people find investing ideas online and on these platforms. How do those ideas spread? On TikTok. Yes, that TikTok. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. People aren't just going to it for sea shanty videos. The personal finance hashtag on TikTok has garnered 3.5 billion views from its 1 billion monthly active users. By comparison, videos found under the cooking and health tips hashtag have 2.6 and 2.1 billion views respectively. The trajectory of Robinhood and TikTok were literally on par. What happened in the stock market this week? So the word of the week is expectations. Absolutely essential that you guys understand the risks of shorting. And Kayla Kilbride and Kyla Scanlon are two of those financial influencer TikTokers, also known as Finfluencers. I think people still care about fashion, they care about culture, but it's also like there's this big behemoth thing called the stock market that we really don't know a whole lot about and it's gatekept behind the industry. And so people like want to unpack that. And so my audience is um, a lot of them are younger investors who are looking to hone their skills. Tech and write up. Kyla and Kayla are two of the more, let's say, professional TikTok influencers. The Tesla ARK Bitcoin biotech risk cluster. I've been trading since high school, and it was a really interesting way for me to fill out my decision-making frameworks and to think about thinking. And I think that the more that we can have people thinking about finance, the better that we're going to progress as a society. I think it's a huge gap in our educational system. If you're going to buy an option for a stock, you think it's going to go up, it's a call. So think of it like this. I made the options video where I was like, options are just like shopping. Rumor has it that this pal is about to go up in price. So if I come in tomorrow, can I still buy it at said price? And a ton of women just like attacked that video and were like, you explain things so much better than my boyfriend or my professor or like I could sit and listen to you all day. And I was like, the this is what I was looking for. <laughs> But TikTok's algorithm does not reward calm and measured videos about responsible investing. It rewards this. Watch this video for 30 seconds and you'll be rich for the rest of your life. I try not to say the A word, the ALGO word, <laughs> because TikTok listens to us. <laughs> The algorithm does impact how you feel. You know, you do notice which videos do better versus which videos do worse. How do you catch someone's attention in less than 60 seconds? And how do you make it something that they're like, I need this in my life? Nearly impossible to do that in 60 seconds. But the people who perfect it are the people that you're going to watch and going to stick around. And where people are sticking around? Reddit. And it's nearly countless subreddits about finance. And by far the biggest one of those is Wall Street Bets. There's a lot of social media platforms out there, but Reddit is like the social media platform for finance. Places like Wall Street Bets is where it all goes down. Started in January 2012, it wasn't long before Wall Street Bets adopted a 4chan-like etiquette, leading to their tagline, like 4chan found a Bloomberg terminal. We had all these unexplained stock moves, and we would be grasping for a wide stock XYZ jump 20% in a day. And you would look at Wall Street bets, and you would see people there talking about buying options in that stock. And it, it sort of you know, squared the circle, so to speak, and, and started making sense. And it was at that point that it was like, wow, we have to start paying attention to this. Some people on the platform really spend tons of time, and others are just looking for entertainment and to have a little bit of fun, effectively gambling or looking for an outlet, trying to make a little bit of money. Then on top of all of that, there were stimulus checks. Now clearly this money is going to people who need to use that to eat, to live, but there's a lot of people who use this money to invest in the stock market. And it's not just stock tips. 
people quote unquote YOLO their entire life savings or stimulus checks on a single stock. They post what is called gain and loss porn, screen grabbing staggering hits and misses on stocks for the entire community to see. I'm about to lose everything. And while some of the people on Wall Street Bets are novice investors, the community contains multitudes. In one respect, what it did show us among these network groups is they are very sophisticated. They're not a bunch of ignorant people talking to other ignorant people. And this is where the pieces of the puzzle all come together to wreak havoc on Wall Street for a solid week in early 2021. It's pretty clear that the combination of more people having retail brokerage accounts and trading apps and more people being stuck at home looking for some kind of entertainment and some kind of community online came together in this very singular way. What came together is GameStop. Let's go back to the beginnings of what happened with GameStop a couple of years ago. On the boards like Reddit and StockTwits, a lot of people were talking about GameStop as being attractive value. Some of them are even, you know, Wall Street alums who, who left the industry and now still have access to tools that they can use to improve their financial well-being and make very good decisions. And I think Roaring Kitty is a perfect example of that. GameStop is one of the most compelling asymmetric opportunities in the market today. Really, I don't understand how you could disagree with that. At the same time that this crowd was talking it up, the hedge fund institutional crowd didn't like this stock at all. And it had the largest short interest of any stock in the New York Stock Exchange going into late 2020. Short selling is a bet that a stock price will fall, and it's a fairly simple concept. An investor borrows a stock and then sells it. The investor is betting on buying the stock back later for a lower price before returning it to the original owner, pocketing the price difference. What a short seller would tell you is that they almost act as a policeman in financial markets, or they're at least looking for companies that aren't what they say they are. And that can range anywhere from an outright fraud that some short sellers try to expose to just a company that's not worth as much as investors think it is. The problem is, if the stock price rises, the short seller has to come up with the money to buy the stock back. And the more it rises, the more it costs. And that's what's called a short squeeze. And the hedge fund Melvin Capital was on the wrong end of that squeeze. Melvin Capital lost over 50% of its money in the month of January alone just from being caught in the short squeeze of the stock. This is where the disruption comes in. One of the most wild stories you're ever going to see. GameStop shares absolutely going nuts. In less than a year, the company's stock has jumped from less than $3 a share to almost $350. Cheers, everybody! <laughs> Roaring Kitty has turned $50,000 or so investment into some $14 million. <laughs> Investors all over social media use the free trading app Robinhood to wreak havoc on Wall Street. They're actually piling on into some of these stocks to really hurt the professional short sellers. And they all used Reddit, Twitter, TikTok, and Discord to tell one another to keep buying and, quote, hold the line and not sell GameStop. People are getting cheerleaded for jumping in, buying at the highs. They're saying, keep going. And it was working, too, until... Thursday morning, the trading app Robinhood sent out this tweet. In light of current market volatility, we are restricting transactions, including GameStop. People were really angry. Robinhood was supposed to allow the regular people to play the same game these big boys are playing. But instead, we were all taken for schmucks and they screwed us. Shares of GameStop are jumping again now that retail investors are being allowed to buy shares of the stock. But what we learned is that when people organize online, they have the ability to disrupt the market. And it was a big sign that ivory walls of an institution aren't as powerful as maybe the institutions want them to be. I don't know if pumping up GameStop was the best use of billions of dollars, but I think that as a signal to society, it was pretty interesting and powerful. The GameStop saga was so impactful that both Vlad Tenev and Roaring Kitty were called in to testify before Congress to clarify each of their roles in the saga. 
One thing that's emerged from the congressional hearings is that they're interested in how retail brokerages make money and whether they're keeping the best interests of their customers in mind. But it's pretty fuzzy as far as what they would actually do as a result. While the frenzy around GameStop eventually subsided, it didn't take long for retail investors to find other areas to invest their money. Take a look at Bitcoin going bananas over the weekend. Bitcoin forms a brand new all-time high. It was after GameStop started to drop that we saw Bitcoin really go up to over 60,000. How much further does this rally have to run? It's compelling to say that money shifted from one venue to the other. While correlation doesn't equal causation, there's a chart out there showing an inverse correlation on meme stocks going down and cryptocurrencies going up. There's definitely an aspect where people are making money on stocks and then moving, you know, they're agnostic, they're not hedge funds, they can invest wherever the hell they want. It's a classic sort of momentum trade. They're going to wherever the winners are and they're willing to jump on and, you know, ride it. So whether it's meme stocks like GameStop, meme coins like Dogecoin, or entirely new ways to invest in art like NFTs, the new kind of retail investor is making its presence known. Over the next 10, maybe 15 years, you're going to continue to see, whether by choice or by force, that baton go from older generations to younger generations. I don't think any single app uh, is, is going to be the thing that disrupts. I think people are the disruptors. How people get ideas about what to invest in has become increasingly entwined with social media. And as social media companies govern more and more of our lives, the fact that now they're tied in more intimately to people's wallets is something that we might want to understand better. Usually what disruption, I think, means is technology comes in, whether it's blogs to the newspapers or online retailing to brick and mortar. They come in and they're in the same business, but they just do it in such a gigantic cost savings that it causes everybody to switch. Well, that's the risk that happens here is that it's so much cheaper to just manage your own money. We're not there yet but costs and conveniences are moving in that direction. So I'd say, Wall Street, you haven't been disrupted yet, but you could be in the coming years, and that the final chapter on this story hasn't been written. Bloomberg's own David Nicholson. Now, his happy place is out in the field, on the open road. But like the rest of the world lately, he's been working from home a lot more than he's used to. COVID-19 has prompted a massive urban exodus as professionals of every ilk yearn for more space to live and work. As a result, rural areas have exploded and they're poised to experience a resurgence as more and more families pack up and leave the big city to try out life in the burbs. But there's one problem with that. Not all internet speeds are created equal. Anyone who might need to upload or download large files for a living may not want to pack up and move to that cabin in the woods just yet. Now, David's house isn't a cabin, but it is in the woods. And inexplicably, his internet is workable. My internet is okay. I pay a lot for it. It's around $140 a month. The download speed's great and the upload speed is terrible, uh, which is really bad for my work because I have to upload these massive files. But I'm definitely one of the more lucky ones in this community. Just a few miles down the road, my buddy has awful internet. It's usually under two down and under 0 0.2 up, so it's, it's often unusable. Some days it's around one, 
-hmm. And other times it'll drop down to about 0.2, 0 0.3. I just want to be able to have internet at my house without having to go outside the normal ways of acquiring internet. It's, it's really frustrating. We're literally miles, a few miles away from downtown, and it just cuts off. This is a problem, and the solutions are not there yet. Because getting high-speed internet in rural areas en masse is something our providers may simply not be ready for. If your internet service doesn't have fast download and upload speeds, then you don't have high-speed harmony. You have. Americans on average pay about $70 a month for internet at home. But in rural areas, it could cost a lot more for a lot less service. So the pricing uh, for a fixed wireless provider here can be something between $80 and $150 uh, for about 25 megabits per second. However, gigabit service, which is 1,000 megabits per second and symmetrical, is running at about 119 a month or 130 a month. That's John Paul. He co-owns Spiral Fiber, an internet service provider here in Nevada County, California. And for the past 10 years, he's been trying to bring an affordable fiber optic network to town. It all started when he applied to be part of the pilot program for Google's fiber service. Across the country, civic boosters have been going to extremes, chanting, Google, Google. singing, Google in the morning. and marching, trying to get the search engine giant to look at their town. The internet these days is crucial to be in the world, to be a part of the world, and to be connected to your community. Google ultimately went with Kansas City, Missouri, which left Paul on a mission to get funding to lay out fiber optic networks for gigabit service. Over the next several years, he would attend conferences and pitch venture capitalists and apply for grants to make his vision come to life. One of the biggest roadblocks to building infrastructure for the internet here in the United States are the existing large providers. They have their land staked out, they would prefer that nobody come in and compete against them. In 2013, we applied for a grant. We went down and met with the commissioners of the California Public Utilities Commission. It was an arduous process to get funded, but we finally did against all odds. We got a $16 million grant, and then we went out to seek venture capital. Then, in March of 2020, the pandemic hit the world. Everybody got locked down, and everybody came home and everybody started using the internet. And I remember seeing on one of the local fixed wireless providers' websites, they've said, hey, we know you're all staying home, but please don't use too much video, and please don't use too much bandwidth. And I thought, that doesn't work. The US connectivity gap is far greater compared to countries that are considered its peers economically. Some developing nations actually have better internet than rural America, like in Kenya, which has a state-of-the-art fiber optic network fed in from their coastline. The American connectivity gap does largely affect rural areas that are either outside of service coverage or simply prohibitively expensive. This is Rebecca. She and her family moved to Nevada County just a couple miles down the road from David. They took for granted that high-speed internet would just exist in the area, and it's not something they even bothered to check on before buying their house. Turns out, all they got was dial-up. We wanted to move where we had a little more space, room for the kids to run around, you know, just be out in the mountains a little bit more. Having come from a bigger city area where Wi-Fi is pretty readily available, we hadn't really considered that in our purchasing of the house, whether that would be an option or not. When school started, and now that we are remote learning with our children and we're doing everything from home, we didn't have the option to do that at our house. So every day when school would start, we'd have to pack the kids up and we'd go to um, my in-laws home. They have a little cabin up in this area that does have Wi-Fi already. Rebecca's situation is the norm in rural America. According to data from the Federal Communications Commission, just 4% of urban Americans lack access to broadband internet. That's compared to almost 40% of people who live in rural areas. But while that was the case, there were also racial and socioeconomic divides in terms of who had that access. In addition to that geographic difference, low-income African-American students, Latino students, and first-generation college students were more likely than others to have only one device at home that shared among multiple siblings and or lack access to that actual connection. 
For most American towns, there's also a lack of competition, forcing internet prices up. And large providers like AT&T and Comcast aren't incentivized to expand service to these rural communities. This is how Xfinity makes life simple, easy, awesome. So in our area, we have a small imprint of Comcast, but they're not going to go out to the more rural areas. It's just not cost effective for them to do it as a large company. In order to lay fiber cable, you're actually physically digging trenches into the ground. And for internet service providers, they're primarily focused on maximizing their profits. And so the fewer customers you have, you know, in any square mile and the more fiber you have to lay, that's just kind of harder to pencil out from a purely economic standpoint. AT&T released a statement on the matter, expressing the need and desire for government assistance to fund fiber optic expansion to areas deemed unprofitable. Comcast released a similar statement, encouraging more public-private collaboration on this effort. Federal agencies do offer grants to help communities build broadband networks, but many have argued that there's not enough flexibility on how to use these funds. The COVID-19 relief package passed by Congress in March and signed by President Donald Trump awarded $43.3 million to 51 projects on the East Coast alone. But it also stipulated that these projects needed to be up and running by December 30th. For contractors who plan projects months and years in advance, it's a scramble to rearrange their schedules to meet that deadline. So what we've been uh, asking the federal government to, to consider is at least have, as long as the projects are getting started, knowing the projects are being put into place to expand both remote learning, uh, working from home, and, and opportunities like that that are truly driven from COVID. We're moving as fast as we can regardless, but hopefully they'll give us some more time. Talking to John Paul, it's clear that he believes broadband is something that can transform a community and should be considered a public good. One of the first communities to come on in the United States with full-on gigabit service was Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now, they're a bigger city, but they're a city that was economically in a downturn. In the last 15 years, the city of Chattanooga has turned around in an amazing way. It's a nexus for young people to move to. It's a place where technology happens. It's not just about logging on to Zoom, you know, to, to connect with your colleagues who might be in New York City. It's also your ability as a small business, you know, operating in the town of Nevada City or wherever it may be to, you know, quickly upload your payroll documents or something onto the cloud or to quickly, you know, swipe a customer's credit card. There's just some really basic business functions and mechanics that I think people in big cities really take for granted and that are just going to be a much bigger challenge for small business owners in rural areas. Historically, the marginalized people, you call them as untouchables or Dalits, uh, they have been kept away from the center of the knowledge. Once you are born into a caste, it is very difficult for you to grow beyond that. You are stuck in that identity. Education is the best uh, uh, way of liberating them. So that's how I chose to work in education sector. The kind of education that we are giving to the marginalized people is going to change not just the fate of these communities in Telangana, but it is going to be the source of inspiration, a uh, you know, source of uh, hope for all the marginalized in this country.
greatest flight in India is the system of caste. For generations of Indians, the social code known as the caste system has defined how people earn a living and whom they marry. Although outlawed seven decades ago, castes remain a significant factor in deciding everything, from family ties and cultural traditions to educational and economic opportunities. Dalits, people who are on the lowest rung of the caste system, constitute almost one-fifth of India's population of 1.3 billion. Not able to afford the high tuition of private schools, many are forced to attend government-funded institutions, which in the past have suffered from poor infrastructure, lower education standards, and high student-to-teacher ratios. But Dr. Praveen Kumar is trying to change that. I am currently working as, uh, you know, head of uh, Telangana Social Welfare Residential Schools. So totally above 400 schools I manage. These are all residential schools for the students who are historically marginalized but talented and then poor. Uh, of them, 60% are girls and then 40% are boys because uh, girls are more marginalized among the marginalized. Their voices are always uh, suppressed. My approach to improve the conditions in the schools uh, has been uh, put your eyes and ears on the ground always. Talk to the parents, talk to the teachers, talk to the students, uh, you know. Uh, stay in the schools and then understand their problems, their challenges, both in classrooms and then the corridors and the dorms. Then go to the dining halls and see what kind of food they are eating and then go to their homes and then what kind of food they are getting and what kind of uh, challenges the parents have. One of the important uh, changes uh, that I brought in after I took over was to complete the transformation of uh, mother tongue to English medium because English medium, as I, as I said, English is the language of emancipation and language uh, that connects you to the whole body of knowledge in the world. So we had to train a lot of teachers. Refer to the dictionary also, okay, and find out the new meanings. As the discussed about the meanings, they reach the hour of the hour. Identity is extremely important. No, it's, it, there, is, there is a scientific evidence to prove that, you know, your sense of identity is extremely uh, crucial to your growth as a successful human being in your life. If uh, you accept an identity which is very humiliating, which reminds you of very painful past, I think uh, that identity will not help you to grow. Not that, I'm not saying that you should forget your past. I'm not saying that. But... That should not be uh, in the bubble in which you must live always. Sveros is an alternative identity. S stands for state. W stands for uh, welfare. Aero. Uh, SW and then Aero is Svero. So the idea is uh, your uh, dreams have to be skybound. So that is what uh, we are trying to achieve by changing the identities. Like, you know, we say, I'm a swero, and uh, I aim to be a doctor. I am a swero, I aim to be a top-notch engineer. I am a swero, I aim to be a top bureaucrat of this country. I am a swero, I want to be a very good actor or, you know, a musician in this uh, in the world. So these are the positive images that are associated with the identity. Just to give an example to you, uh, see, uh, in 2012, in our institution, we used to produce about six doctors per year. But uh, because of our, uh, you know, this uh, self-liberating ideology of spheroism, uh, we have, uh, this year, we have produced about 189 uh, doctors. This is phenomenal for any poorest of the poor people. You know how difficult it is to get into a medical colleges in this country. So, but today, uh, because of this ideology, the students have been able to achieve this, uh, you know, feat. Uh, Pooja Pandey, 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 Pooja Pandey,
and the parents themselves are agricultural laborers. And then this girl used to sell vegetables, but thanks to the residential education institutions, she came to the Gauridaddi campus and then she toiled very hard for one year uh, despite uh, you know, many problems. And uh, today I'm so happy to share with you that you know she is uh, she has joined uh, one of the prestigious medical colleges in the state of Telangana, Usmani Medical College. And then in future, you know she hopes to be a gynecologist. So this is the journey uh, our children are hoping for. Similarly, the Mount Everest expedition. At Mount Everest expedition, we were uh, we, are, we are very fortunate enough uh, to place. Uh, the youngest ever female in the history of this world on the peak of Mount Everest. How did this happen? It's all because of an ideology that helps you to liberate yourself. We got a lot of extracurricular activities and most of them got institutionalized now. So for example, music. Similarly, the games. We have so many coaching academies. We have boxing academy, we have wrestling academy, we have uh, handball academy. So we have, uh, you know, kabaddi, that uh, the traditional Indian sport. We have golf. We have introduced golf also. Like golf is generally played by so-called rich people, but today even poorest of the poor people also are being trained in uh, golf in our schools. Wow, so our intention has been to give all 360 degrees, uh, you know type of opportunities to the students so that uh, you know whoever is interested in whatever activity they can go and then do it break the barriers break the fence at least mentally because the poor people have been programmed to be victims programmed to be subjugated programmed to be on the margins always programmed to feel inferior we wanted to change all that. There are certain games which are exclusive to rich people. There are certain languages which are exclusive to middle class and upper middle class in this country. To put it in one word, the sole aim of uh, introducing all these co-curricular activities is to break the uh, stereotypes which are recklessly imposed on these people. Their stereotypes Dr. Kumar knows all too well. Born a Dalit, his grandparents were laborers and access to the village well was restricted. Dr. Kumar credits his parents' belief in the power of education with helping him realize his aspirations. He went on to join the Indian Police Service, attended Harvard University, and then began pursuing educational reforms back home. I attribute uh, whatever I am today it's to my mother primarily. They educated me in the village, although there were uh, no good schools. So then I stayed in uh, social welfare hostels, the hostels which were managed by government uh, for the poorest of the poor kids. I passed with uh, you know reasonably good grades. Then I went to university and then I faced the uh, worst form of uh, discrimination in the universities. Like uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, in those days I'm talking about, so the bathrooms and the, you know, toilets were exclusively meant for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. We used to fight discrimination on one hand and then again, you know, uh, try to excel in academics, uh, you know, day in and day out. So that's how I came to education because I deeply believe that uh, education is the only important weapon uh, that can really, you know, place the poorest of the poor people from uh, from a very victimhood orbit to a prosperous orbit. I think uh, in future, this is going to be a game changer for the marginalized in this country.
If you look at a thermal image of a city and then compare that to a map of vegetation, you'll find that where there's greenery, the temperature is lower. That's because things like asphalt, concrete and shingled roofs absorb more heat from the sun than trees. This is the urban heat island effect and it accounts for higher temperatures in cities, often by several degrees compared with their surroundings. It's becoming a huge risk to human health as growing urban populations exacerbate the heating effects of climate change. Heat waves kill more people than any other extreme weather event, more than tornadoes, hurricanes, and even floods. That's why urban heat island mitigation strategies are being studied in Singapore by a group of researchers. The government-backed project called Cooling Singapore is now in the process of combining everything they've learned to create a digital tool that can help cities all over the world, starting with Singapore. In Singapore, close to the equator, temperatures regularly rise above 32 degrees Celsius, or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the city structures only make it worse. And that is also the case for Singapore, which is basically a concrete jungle, more urbanized, more developed city. And even in Singapore, what you have is a situation whereby there's a temperature difference of 7 degrees Celsius between the more urbanized and the more rural areas. The government has taken drastic steps to keep temperatures down. This is Gardens by the Bay, an award-winning park, and inside this greenhouse is a pleasant 24 degrees. That's because the dome, along with two dozen nearby towers full of thousands of people, is chilled by what's probably the world's largest underground district cooling system. It uses a large central plant that cools water and then pipes it into banks, residential towers, an exhibition centre, shopping malls and the city's iconic Marina Bay Sands hotel and casino complex. So one of the biggest perks of using this system for the buildings is that they can save 40% in terms of electricity usage compared to your traditional air conditioners. And with Singapore relying on natural gas for most of its power, this new system means emission savings equivalent to removing 10,000 cars from the city's roads. That has big implications for the rest of the world. If things stay as they are, more than a third of the world's electricity could end up being used to cool buildings and vehicles by 2050. As the world gets hotter, gets warmer, there is a greater need for air conditioning and as well as refrigerators, for instance. And the more people are buying these household appliances, the more energy usage they, they, they use and uh, they release heat more and that then exacerbates climate change. It's a vicious circle. And so since 2017, researchers at Cooling Singapore have been identifying design solutions that reduce our need for so much cool air in the first place. One thing many cities have in common, and that's the importance of vegetation. That's a very important measure to mitigate the urban heat because of the shading effect, of course, and the psychological effects of the vegetation, and also because of the possible evaporative cooling effect of the vegetation. Vegetation can be, of course, on the ground floor in form of trees and shrubs, and you can walk under them. This is the so-called canopy layer that the vegetation forms above us. But vegetation can also go up the facades of buildings, and it can go to the roof of the buildings. Luckily, Singapore has been striving for the garden city feel for quite some time. It was a vision initially introduced by then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew in 1967 to make life more pleasant for people. And today, Singapore is one of the world's greenest cities in terms of urban vegetation. Kampung Admiralty, a community centre that contains health facilities and social spaces, now provides more green space than the plot of land it was originally built on. It's topped by a roofscape of staggered terraces covered in local plants, which functions as a community park and a village green in the centre that contains farm plots for residents to tend to. 
Park Royal on Pickering was designed as a hotel in a garden that doubled the green growing potential of its site. There's now 15,000 meters of sky gardens, reflecting pools, waterfalls, planter terraces, and green walls. And the government has big plans as well. Singapore actually has a plan to plant one million trees and add more green spaces over the next 10 years. It is actually a mix of one thing to reduce the urban heat island effect, but on the other hand, is also to get the people to be more connected to nature. But it's not enough. The city-state has still been warming twice as quickly as the world average over the past six decades. That's why Cooling Singapore has developed a catalogue of other potential heat mitigation measures. When you try to mitigate your heat island effect in a city or in any building, in a village as well, the first place to start is by shading of the windows. You have to keep areas clear so that the wind can move through it. Uh, water of a certain depth can act as a very good thermal buffer. If you have to construct heavy buildings such as high rises, at least you can make the surface, the facade, less heavy and you can protect it from direct sun penetration. We have to make sure that no combustion engines will be in the city in the middle and the medium to long term range. So ideally the electricity production is outside of the city and you bring just the clean electricity into the city. You can at least minimize the use of energy in the city and you can start to slowly convert the roofs, the facades of the city into production areas for renewable energy. In Singapore, unfortunately, this is a limited option, but in the long run, it could produce up to 20, 25% of the energy of the electricity needed in Singapore if all the roofs and the areas in the buildings, on the buildings, on the facades would be used to do that. With so many different ideas, Cooling Singapore is also designing a virtual model of the city to test them out. It's called a Digital Urban Climate Twin, or DUCT, that will calculate how each element of the city's design will impact the urban heat island effect. That means we model not only the geometry of the buildings digitally, but also we model the transportation, the insulation, the temperature, the radiation coming from the sun, the weather, the local weather, the local climate, the even very, very microclimate of the city, the water, the movement of people in the city. We can invent scenarios, we can design scenarios, test them before we actually build them. And if they test very well, and we are sure that they will function, then we can start to build them and put them into reality. Singapore will be using this new tool to figure out which actions it should take next. And the model can be applied to any city, whether it needs to keep heat out or keep heat in, which will ultimately save energy, slow climate change and improve our quality of life. So this is something that Singapore will be able to export, maybe even together with its city development systems that it already has. Singapore is one of the very few cities in the world that really combine this scientific approach with a very well-established urban redesign and urban design approach. Through its agencies and the combination of its agencies, it has achieved a lot um, in the past. If it keeps following the scientific path and the combination with the other knowledge in the city already, we think that it will be a very comfortable and very livable uh, city in the future, even more than today.
Times are tough. Jobs are scarce. It's risky to be outside and around others. Seems like there's very few ways to make extra money during a pandemic. So I guess I'll just hunker down and binge social media until this all blows over. <sighs> Wait, don't these people make money? How do these people make money? Streamers, YouTubers, Twitch stars, how do they make money? Is it a lot? Is it a lot of work? I know, I gotta ask somebody in the biz, and I got just the guy, Austin John Plays. Is, this is your full-time job now, right? As of November of last year, yes. This was always just kind of like a side thing. Like, any money that I made from doing my videos and whatever else, I never touched that, because I didn't really think of that as being like real money. And then it started coming in more and more. And then it was like, I hit my first day that I broke a grand. And I was like, this is actually gonna be money. How did the YouTube channel come to be? When the game Pokemon Sun and Moon came out for the 3DS, there was like things that I learned about the game. And then I, I wanted to just share that information with people. And at the time, I didn't have any way to capture a screen or anything, so I found like generic footage and I kind of put it all together with so much editing. And that video got six views. And then two days later, I made another one. And that one got 12 views. And then I just started pumping out more and more content and people were like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And it really just started building on top of itself. And then it was like, <sighs> my channel really focuses on tips and tricks. So I play a straight 18 hours and I'll finish the game or get to about the 40 hour mark and then I'll make my first video. While I'm going through, I have a giant notepad and just scribbles everywhere and I make these notes of like the things that stumped me so I know the things that may stump other people. Uh, what do you need to think about if you're building your YouTube channel? One, you need to do something that you're passionate about. Not that you like, not that you think you're gonna make money on, something you're passionate about. This other thing is something that other people are passionate about. It holds a special place to them. And third is, it needs to be something that people are gonna seek out information on. In order to enter into the marketplace, you either need to be better than everyone else, you either need to be faster than everyone else, or you need to be more accessible than everyone else. And you can't be more accessible because it's already on the platform. Granted, if you understand how the algorithm works, which is very similar to Google Analytics, then yeah, you can have a little bit of a head start. But if you're not doing it faster, and if you're not doing it better than everyone else, then why should anyone watch your channel? So my income as a YouTuber kind of breaks down to three different ways. One, which is the bulk of it, which is ad revenue. Whenever you go and you watch a video and then there's an ad and then you wait five seconds and you hit the bottom right corner and then you go on to the next video or a non-skippable ad or the video starts immediately, you get the little banner ad at the bottom or uh, if you scroll down from the video, the first thing that shows there is an ad. Those are the four different types of ads that can appear on every single YouTube video. And all of them pay a certain amount. It varies on lots of things like the country, of the person who posts it, the country of the person who watches it, uh, the time of year, where you are in the quarter, if there's anything going on with uh, a reduction in ad revenue. Like, great example, COVID-19, companies weren't as spending as much on advertising. So because of that, CPM went down. Uh, CPM stands for a click per thousand. I'm using the Roman numeral for thousand. And that means that for every 1,000 views, you get a certain amount of money. Now, on low ads, when I first started off, my CPM was 30 cents. So every 1,000 views, I made 30 cents. But then once I signed with an MCN and I started making more quality content and more engaging content, some of my better videos and certain times of the year, I can see CPMs as high as 12 to $14. And there's a big fluctuation between, you know, if I post a video when there's no ads being spent like January and February, that's a reason a lot of your favorite YouTubers and also TV shows don't post new videos uh, in that time of year because ad rates are down. Why are they going to make content then? Instead, you're recording and you're bulking up for when ad revenue is higher. 
The second way that a YouTuber makes uh, income is support, crowdfunding, things like that. When I first started off, Patreon was really the only option, but then they started rolling out supporters and members for YouTube channels. So whenever I have a live stream, you can click a button and then you can become a member and then you get uh, special icons next to your name. I believe they're called badges or on any video, you can hit the join button and that helps support the channel. And then the third aspect of that would be merch. And for me, my merch has been somewhat basic. In fact, I'm wearing one of my t-shirts from last year right now. You have to endure the times that your first video gets six views, that you post it on Reddit and they say, shut up, and then an auto mod bans you. You have to go through that because until you go through that and you discover why you're doing it, you're not doing it for other people. You're doing it for yourself. If you're not loving what you do, then it's not worth it. Huh. So make a channel about something that I'm passionate about. Oh, sweet. I guess I can make the channel about that. Now, how do I grow an audience? How do I get popular? It's all about diversification, right? You have to have a massive Twitter following. You have to have a massive Instagram following. You have to have a massive YouTube following. Of course, you have to be on Twitch, which is the key platform. But basically, any way you can get in front of your audience, you can engage with your audience. Um, is going to drive those clicks, which ultimately drives the advertiser revenue that you get back from all of these platforms. It's me and Dan playing video games and talking in a funny manner over them. They're not just people who are good at games. They're actually people who are good at online engagement, online entertainment, first and foremost. You have the right to remain stylish. Anything you wear can and will be used against you in the court of fashion. The streamer is either very, very talented at the game the best player in the game is generally going to draw a crowd because people like watching people who are very good. On the other hand, they're either very, very good or funny, charismatic, whatever it is on that side. Oh, no. You know, it becomes more of a show where they talk about other things outside of the gaming world and gaming becomes really just a backdrop and an excuse to engage with that audience. There, there were those weird, like, Ronald McDonald, like, straight-to-VHS movies. You remember those? I'm personable, I'm chatty. I would kind of, you know, when boring things were happening in the game, I would ramble on about, you know, movies I'd watched or books I'd read and, you know, or conversations I'd had and stuff like that. And so I think being personable was a big part of that. It's not just getting on and playing games. It's getting on and being an entertainer. You are putting on a show. All right, now let me go ahead and grab the samurai sword that every gym has. Okay, he's dead. To have a larger audience and, and to have that audience, I think, stay with you, you have to bring something extra. You, know? you have to find your niche. You have to find what works and what connects with the audience and, and what makes them laugh and what makes them keep coming back. Then you got to make it a little more exciting. All right? Throw in a hanging bishop. Have everybody in suspense for a moment. I think the real most important thing is is to just get used to being on camera. Like in any sort of performance thing, is get used to talking on camera. Um, you know, I was my first few videos were terrible. But because I sat down and did it for six to eight hours a day, I just got used to talking and I got over that uncomfortable hump. If you go into Twitch purely with the expectation that you're going to make money, make a job out of it, have all this growth and it's going to be great, you're probably going to burn out prior to getting to that point because there's very little payoff for a long time, right? Like multiple years generally before you really start to see a payoff. And so, you know, those first few times you're streaming, nobody is there. One person shows up every 30 minutes, says hi, maybe, and leaves, right? Like, it's very uh, discouraging, I think, for a lot of people. And so you have to be there just loving it. You have to love talking to yourself when nobody is around. You have to love just the game that you're playing, all of that stuff, because it takes 
a while, and I think a majority of people burn out prior to getting to the, like, profitable point of it. And there you have it. My very own YouTube, Twitch, Discord, and streaming channels all ready to go live. It's a veritable social media ecosystem just on the verge of thriving. So don't forget to smash like and subscribe and visit my Patreon for perks. Also, go to my merch page. And one last thing, stay cool, my friends. live stream shopping, one of the hottest trends in China. Every night, tens of millions of people watch live shows hosted by influencers like Bia and buy the products they recommend. Or on e-commerce and social apps like Taobao and Douyin, the sister app of TikTok. Not about you know only shopping. It's about the experience. It's about having fun. You got to see three D. You got to see in some kind of action. It's almost like a theater act. The internet craze has taken over China. By the end of 2020, the country had almost 400 million live stream shopping users. China's live stream e-commerce market has also grown dramatically. With an estimated value of 161 billion dollars in 2020, it's becoming popular outside China as well. So, is live streaming the future of shopping? Live streaming is not a new thing. In China, it started in 2015 with the rollout of 4G, and it was first used for entertainment and socializing. Many live streamers performed for their followers or chatted to them, making money by receiving virtual currency and gifts. In the West, live streaming is mainly the domain of avid gamers. In China, it's broken into e-commerce. China actually has a very big e-commerce empire, so it uses these super apps, what we call、um, that. You have payment, you have search of information, you have recommendation system, and you have huge amount of goods available on the platform, and as well as a lot of consumers. So with this advantage, they merge、um, these features of live streaming、uh, to make the influencers actually sell goods. Here is a perfect choice: nice neutrals, beautiful print, nothing overwhelming, and the. Warmth and comfort of flannel. This is item. Traditional TV shopping involves a one-way direction, whereby a host introduces a product, demonstrates certain things, and say, "Call this number" or something. But live stream shopping is live. That in itself is a very, very big difference. It causes different psychology, and live stream shopping is a, a very entertaining way of actually engaging someone else. When you shop, actually, the、uh, live streaming video will continue. It will minimize into a corner, and you can like buy the items and pay all on the same app. And after that, the live streaming screen will just enlarge by itself, and the、uh, promoter will come back to screen. So it's like very convenient. Taobao, one of China's biggest e-commerce platforms owned by tech giant Alibaba, added a live streaming function in early 2016. In the following years, other e-commerce and social platforms like JD and Douyin also integrated this feature. 开头的时候还是有很多的挑战的，对画面的这个流畅，然后是否能够很真实的去还原商品，它其实在这个上面是有很高的这个门槛跟技术的这个卡口在的。
，不管是我们的这个用户的接受度，还是商家的这个上手的这个难度都很高。但是这几年下来，基本上难点在不断被突破的。Over 70 billion dollars worth of goods was sold via live stream on Taobao in the year through March 2021. Latest surveys show that over 60 percent of live stream users in China were watching shopping shows, and over 65 percent of them shopped at least once via live stream. In 2020, live stream shopping got a huge boost during the pandemic. When millions of people were in lockdown and many retailers were pushed online, people, you know, during the lockdown, felt like there's a need for more social uh, interactions. This live platform creates an interesting kind of uh, environment that these people sense they're actually interacting with you. And then live stream shopping brings in a lot more variety of things that people could buy and satisfy, you know, their sense of, the sense of like, losing control, especially during the pandemic. At the heart of this craze are the top influencers who have tens of millions of followers and sell products worth millions of dollars every night. They often use their star power to get bargains from retailers, which in turn boosts their own sales and influence. So if you think about um, China's live streaming, you have to know the king and queen of the influencers. The queen of live streaming, Via, she is actually having the biggest viewership and uh, the biggest sales volume for a long time on Taobao platform. She can sell everything from like Gucci sunglasses, um, lipsticks, homes and cars. One time she offered her followers to go on a Tesla ride with her and she even, for once, saw the rocket launch in her live streaming room for 40 million yuan. The king would be Li Jiaqi, more widely known as Lipstick's brother. He used to be a cosmetic sales um, before he turned into live streaming e-commerce. And uh, he knows a lot about the cosmetics. So he's the one that will actually put the lipsticks on himself when uh, he's on the show. Top live streamers like Via and Li Jiaqi have become celebrities in China and can earn millions of dollars a year. Although not everyone can be as popular, mid-ranking live streamers like Tiffany still earn a good income through sales commissions. If we talk about the sales commission, the sales commission is higher than the average work. But the sales commission is a very difficult task for the body and for the mind. It is a very difficult task for the body and for the mind. 呃，集中精力，然后长达五六个小时，这种状态是很累的。而且这五六个小时的话，你是脑子是不停的，然后也嘴巴是不停的，然后手也是不停的，眼睛也是不停的。像我们做主播，不是说单一的只做直播一件事情，然后还会有呃选品的一些工作，然后还会有一些其他的事情排在里面，其实是没有个人生活的。那我觉得增强粉丝影响力的话，不是说某一件事情。啊，可能今天做了什么事情，你就增大了影响力，而是每天不断不断的内容的输出，粉丝不断的可能对你的了解，慢慢的信任你。没有芝麻的芝麻酱的味道，如果吃不习惯的话就慎买。A lot of successful live streamers are generally very good at communication. They're very good at at articulating very simply what a product does, what a product doesn't do. In order for them to sell, they need to be trustworthy. And appear trustworthy, and they need to, you know, show in some ways that they're authentic, right? So for Via and Lichasi, they are able to articulate that quite a bit through their body language, through what they say. For example, uh, Lichasi will always, you know, sometimes say things bad, bad things about certain products because to him, that's his honest opinion, and sometimes people want to hear that. And so they seem very credible, they seem very trustworthy, and uh, don't forget, they're also very entertaining and very interesting. If you're familiar with Li Chiaxi, he won a, a Guinness record for like the most lipstick applications to models in like, 30 seconds. So if you're able to create a lot of buzz with really interesting things that you do, people who may not want to buy lipsticks will also stream in just to watch what he does. And then from there, you, you might get hooked. Live streamers also use sales techniques such as limited time or supply. This sense of scarcity can often encourage viewers to buy. The platform in itself creates and enhances some of these things, but you see it live. Something we call social proof has taken over, meaning that, hey, other people are interested, other people are joining in, other people want the same product. 
and they add it in the chat and they ask questions and they say, oh, I want this too. What happens then? It makes the whole product even more scarce. But it's not just influencers. Local farmers, luxury brands, even mutual funds have also started their own live stream shows. Working with very top tier live streamers can be risky. It's not necessary that the benefits will end up with a brand. So we see company executives opening their own shows, um, and we see like PNG have their own sales room which runs shows every day as well. Uh, we also have like local governors in like small towns to sell their agricultural products. So the live streaming is definitely transformed the way product owners can think about how to reach their consumers and it enables a lot of players to actually sell. Live stream shopping is going global. Merchants in Southeast Asia have embraced this trend. And in the West, Amazon has upgraded its live streaming function, adding interactive features like chat rooms. Companies, including Google and Facebook, are also developing and investing in technologies to integrate video and e-commerce. 直播电商它其实已经开始成为主流，它未来的发展空间跟潜力都是巨大的。接下来大家会越来越依赖这种购物方式，会变成一个比较日常化、比较规范化的这么一个趋势。If you look at the numbers alone, their numbers alone, Li Jiaxi's numbers or Via's numbers, you know that they can sell, and you know that you know they can generate revenue. Are they able to sustain it over a long period of time? Uh, it depends on how innovative they are at changing some of the things that they do. But you can't expect consumers one day turn into virtual shopping for good. There will be the nature of us that crave to go into the store to touch the goods and actually wear it and see how it looks like and walk around in that with our friends. And those things wouldn't be replaceable with live streaming. Imagine that the oceans are actually the largest battery. We're storing huge amounts of energy in the oceans. The wave motion can be very deep. It can extend down several hundred meters. And once it gets to the near shore, from about 50 meters, the whole water column is moving backwards and forwards. As we search for ways to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, some are looking to a largely untapped potential source of renewable energy. In theory, waves off the coast of the United States alone could generate over 2 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity a year, enough to power more than half of the country. Waves intensify and subside not as quickly as the wind, and that means that it can produce a smoother power generation curve. One of the potential advantages of wave energy is that um, it could act as a complementary source of power um, compared to other renewables on the grid if it were to be scaled up to commercial scale. For decades, engineers have been trying to convert wave energy into electricity, but a host of technological and financial challenges have complicated their efforts. In the years from around 2006 to 2015, there were um, a spate of bankruptcies in the sector, and this was largely because of a lack of kind of continuous proven projects out at sea with reliable electricity generation. Since then, companies have been trying to develop the technologies at a steadier pace and with a smaller cash burn. But the same questions remain. Can companies develop devices and technologies that actually work? Is wave energy just a novelty or something that can become a major renewable energy source?
BC is a very challenging environment within which to operate a power project. So seawater is corrosive and conditions are very rough. So this means that power projects don't have a very long lifetime and it increases operating and maintenance costs. Partly because of that, many early wave energy projects hit rough waters, such as the Palamas Wave Energy Converter in Portugal and the Isla Limpet project in Scotland. But that hasn't stopped others from trying. Companies are focused on testing projects out at sea, proving their durability, um, trying to raise capital and bring down cost. The sector hasn't really um, converged around one single technology design and companies are kind of undecided about which design works best. Finland-based AW Energy is a veteran in the sector. The first proof of concept of the company's device was made in the 90s after diver Rauno Koivosari observed the strong back and forth movement of a hatch cover in a shipwreck in the Baltic Sea. The waves are generated far from the coastline, so the wind blows on the, on the surface of the water, causing the water particles to rotate, and that rotation extends deep down below the surface. And, and the waves can be very long. They can be several hundred meters long. And as they come into the near shore, this rotational energy turns into an elliptical energy. And eventually, backwards and forwards, as you probably noticed if you've been swimming on the seashore in large waves, you're pulled in and out. That's the energy that we're extracting. But there's a sweet spot where we deploy. So around 10 to 15 meters of water depth, that's where there's still strong wave energy coming in. After years of research, prototyping and testing, the company has deployed Wave Roller, a 350 kilowatt device in the waters of Portugal. Wave Roller has an 18 meter wide and 10 meter high steel panel fixed to the seabed via a floatable foundation. The panel moves back and forth with the waves, capturing the energy. It's submerged in the depth of 15 meters, so it's, it's protected from the extreme waves. We generate electricity by capturing the movement with hydraulic circuitry in a machine room underneath the surface. That hydraulic energy we turn to electricity with hydraulic accumulators and hydraulic motors and also a generator. The wave roller has survived large waves at sea for over a year and delivered electricity via an underwater cable to the grid in Portugal. Meanwhile, the company has won a 2.5 million euro grant to work on an upgraded version of the wave roller, aiming to increase the electricity generation capacity to one megawatt. The upscale device would have a bigger panel, two power takeoff units and improved software to control the energy production. We have uh, taken into use a wave prediction algorithm that kind of tells us what kind of waves are coming in to our device. That gives us a few seconds to prepare uh, for capturing more energy, and the difference in that is significant. Our future plans are to deliver technology around the world. So I'm hoping that we can be working on on delivering technology to projects in Asia and, and also in, in the American continent as well. Meanwhile, Israeli company Eco Wave Power is taking a different approach to capturing the power of the ocean. For the company's founder, Inna Braverman, developing new sources of renewable energy is a personal mission. I was born in Ukraine in 1996 and two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, causing the largest in history nuclear disaster. I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of such explosion. I had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. Luckily, my mother and nurse approached my crib on time and gave me a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, which saved my life. I got a second chance in life and decided to do something good with it. Growing up, Inna wanted to be a politician to positively change the world. After working as a translator at a renewable energy company, she decided to change paths. 
solar and wind energy were fully commercialized. There were a lot of amazing technologies implemented everywhere. I saw that wave energy, although it's an immense source of electricity, the biggest companies in the world are trying to develop wave energy with no success. And there was kind of a race going on in the world of who is the company that is going to develop a viable wave energy solution first. In 2011, the then 24-year-old Inner co-founded EcoWave Power. Instead of installing devices offshore, the company's devices are attached to existing breakwaters, jetties, and piers. Our technology is very cost-efficient, especially in comparison to the offshore technologies, because we don't need any ships, divers, underwater mooring, or cables. We install on existent man-made structures, and all our expensive equipment, the generator, the hydraulic conversion unit, the automation, is located on land, just like a regular power station. This is the EcoWave Power conversion unit that has been operating in Jaffa port since 2014 until 2020. Here, you can see how the technology works. Basically, the floaters are going up and down, and pushing the hydro cylinders, which transmit biodegradable fluid into land-located accumulators. A pressure is being built, the higher the wave, the higher the pressure, which is used to turn the hydro motor, which is turning the generators. The whole system is controlled by a smart automation system, which you can see right here. And in case of upcoming storms, the system automatically raises the floater above the water level, and keeps them in the upward position until the storm passes. The company has been operating a 100 kilowatt grid connected device in Gibraltar since 2016, which is enough to power 100 households. Currently, Inna and her team are working on another 100 kilowatt project at the Port of Jaffa in Tel Aviv. The project will be also the first time in the history of Israel that wave.